War and Peace, Volume 7, Author, Graf Leo Tolstoy. Chapter 347. Natasha had married in the early spring of 1813, and in 1820 already had three daughters besides a son for whom she had longed and whom she was now nursing. She had grown stouter and broader, so that it was difficult to recognize in this robust, motherly woman the slim, lively Natasha of former days. Her features were more defined and had a calm, soft, and serene expression. In her face there was none of the ever-glowing animation that had formerly burned there and constituted its charm. Now her face and body were often all that one saw, and her soul was not visible at all. All that struck the eye was a strong, handsome, and fertile woman. The old fire very rarely kindled in her face now. That happened only when, as was the case that day, her husband returned home. Or a sick child was convalescent, or when she and Countess Mary spoke of Prince Andrew, she never mentioned him to her husband, who she imagined was jealous of Prince Andrew's memory, or on the rare occasions when something happened to induce her to sing, a practice she had quite abandoned since her marriage. At the rare moments when the old fire did kindle in her handsome, fully developed body she was even more attractive than in former days. Since their marriage Natasha and her husband had lived in Moscow, in Petersburg, on their estate near Moscow, or with her mother, that is to say, in Nicholas' house. The young Countess Bezakova was not often seen in society, and those who met her there were not pleased with her, and found her neither attractive nor amiable. Not that Natasha liked solitude, she did not know whether she liked it or not, she even thought that she did not, but with her pregnancies, her confinements, the nursing of her children, and sharing every moment of her husband's life, she had demands on her time which could be satisfied only by renouncing society. All who had known Natasha before her marriage wondered at the change in her as it's something extraordinary. Only the old countess with her maternal instinct had realized that all Natasha's outbursts had been due to her need of children and a husband, as she herself had once exclaimed. At Otradno not so much in fun as in earnest, and her mother was now surprised at the surprise expressed by those who had never understood Natasha, and she kept saying that she had always known that Natasha would make an exemplary wife and mother. Only she lets her love of her husband and children overflow all bounds, said the countess, so that it even becomes absurd. Natasha did not follow the golden rule advocated by clever folk, especially by the French, which says that a girl should not let herself go when she marries, should not neglect her accomplishments, should be even more careful of her appearance than when she was unmarried, and should fascinate her husband as much as she did before he became her husband. Natasha on the contrary had at once abandoned all her witchery, of which her singing had been an unusually powerful part. She gave it up, just because it was so powerfully seductive. She took no pains with her manners or with delicacy of speech, or with her toilet, or to show herself to her husband in her most becoming attitudes, or to avoid inconveniencing him by being too exacting. She acted in contradiction to all those rules. She felt that the allurements instinct had formerly taught her to use would now be merely ridiculous in the eyes of her husband, to whom she had from the first moment given herself up entirely, that is, with her whole soul, leaving no corner of it hidden. From him, she felt that her unity with her husband was not maintained by the poetic feelings that had attracted him to her, but by something else, indefinite but firm as the bond between her own body and soul. To fluff out her curls, put on fashionable dresses, and sing romantic 
songs to fascinate her husband would have seemed as strange as to adorn herself to attract herself. To adorn herself for others might perhaps have been agreeable, she did not know, but she had no time at all for it. The chief reason for devoting no time either to singing, to dress, or to choosing her words was that she really had no time to spare for these things. We know that man has the faculty of becoming completely absorbed in a subject however trivial it may be, and that there is no subject so trivial that it will not grow to infinite proportions if one's entire attention is devoted to it. The subject which wholly engrossed Natasha's attention was her family. That is, her husband whom she had to keep so that he should belong entirely to her and to the home, and the children whom she had to bear. Bring into the world, nurse, and bring up. And the deeper she penetrated, not with her mind only but with her whole soul, her whole being, into the subject that absorbed her, the larger. Did that subject grow and the weaker and more inadequate did her powers appear, so that she concentrated them wholly on that one thing and yet was unable to accomplish all that she considered necessary. There were then as now conversations and discussions about women's rights, the relations of husband and wife and their freedom and rights. Though these themes were not yet termed questions as they are now, but these topics were not merely uninteresting to Natasha, she positively did not understand them. These questions, then as now, existed only for those who see nothing in marriage but the pleasure married people get from one another, that is, only the beginnings of marriage and not its whole significance, which lies in the family. Discussions and questions of that kind, which are like the question of how to get the greatest gratification from one's dinner, did not then and do not now exist for those for whom the purpose of a dinner is the nourishment it affords, and the purpose of marriage is the family. If the purpose of dinner is to nourish the body, a man who eats too, dinners at once may perhaps get more enjoyment but will not attain his purpose, for his stomach will not digest the two dinners. If the purpose of marriage is the family, the person who wishes to have many wives or husbands may perhaps obtain much pleasure, but in that case will not have a family. If the purpose of food is nourishment and the purpose of marriage is the family, the whole question resolves itself into not eating more than one can digest, and not having more wives or husbands than are needed for the family, that is, one wife or one husband. Natasha needed a husband. A husband was given her and he gave her a family. And she not only saw no need of any other or better husband, but as all the powers of her soul were intent on serving that husband and family, she could not imagine. And saw no interest in imagining how it would be if things were different. Natasha did not care for society in general, but prized the more the society of her relatives, Countess Mary, and her brother, her mother, and Sonia. She valued the company of those to whom she could come striding, disheveled from the nursery in her dressing gown, and with joyful face show a yellow instead of a green stain on baby's napkin, and from whom she could hear reassuring words to the effect that baby was much better. To such an extent had Natasha let herself go that the way she dressed and did her hair, her ill-chosen words, and her jealousy, she was jealous of Sonia, of the governess, and of every woman, pretty or plain, were habitual subjects of jest to those about her. The general opinion was that Pierre was under his wife's thumb, which was really true. From the very first days of their married life Natasha had announced her demands. Pierre was greatly surprised by his wife's view, to him a perfectly novel one, that every moment of his life belonged to her and to the family. His wife's demands astonished him, but they also flattered him and he submitted to them. 
Pierre's subjection consisted in the fact that he not only dared not flirt with, but dared not even speak smilingly to, any other woman, did not dare dine at the club as a pastime, did not dare spend money on a whim, and did not dare absent himself for any length of time, except on business, in which his wife included his intellectual pursuits, which she did not in the least understand but to which she attributed great importance. To make up for this, at home Pierre had the right to regulate his life and that of the whole family exactly as he chose. At home Natasha placed herself in the position of a slave to her husband. And the whole household went on tiptoe when he was occupied, that is, was reading or writing in his study. Pierre had but to show a partiality for anything to get just what he liked done always. He had only to express a wish and Natasha would jump up and run to fulfill it. The entire household was governed according to Pierre's supposed orders. That is, by his wishes which Natasha tried to guess. Their way of life and place of residence, their acquaintances and ties, Natasha's occupations, the children's upbringing, were all selected not merely with regard to Pierre's expressed wishes, but to what Natasha from the thoughts he expressed in conversation supposed his wishes to be. And she deduced the essentials of his wishes quite correctly, and having once arrived at them clung to them tenaciously. When Pierre himself wanted to change his mind she would fight him with his own weapons. Thus in a time of trouble ever memorable to him after the birth of their first child who was delicate, when they had to change the wet nurse. Three times and Natasha fell ill from despair, Pierre one day told her of Rousseau's view, with which he quite agreed, that to have a wet nurse is unnatural and harmful. When her next baby was born, despite the opposition of her mother, the doctors, and even of her husband, himself, who were all vigorously opposed to her nursing her baby herself. A thing then unheard of and considered injurious, she insisted on having her own way, and after that nursed all her babies herself. It very often happened that in a moment of irritation husband and wife would have a dispute, but long afterwards Pierre to his surprise and delight would find in his wife's ideas and actions the very thought against which she had argued, but divested of everything superfluous. That in the excitement of the dispute he had added when expressing his opinion. After seven years of marriage Pierre had the joyous and firm consciousness that he was not a bad man, and he felt this because he saw himself reflected in his wife. He felt the good and bad within himself, inextricably mingled and overlapping but only what was really good in him was reflected in his wife, all that was not quite good was rejected. And this was not the result of logical reasoning but was a direct and mysterious reflection. Chapter 348 Two months previously when Pierre was already staying with the Rostovs, he had received a letter from Prince Theodore, asking him to come to Petersburg to confer on some important questions that were being discussed there by a society of which Pierre was one of the principal founders. On reading that letter, she always read her husband's letters, Natasha herself suggested that he should go to Petersburg, though she would feel his absence very acutely. She attributed immense importance to all her husband's intellectual and abstract interests though she did not understand them, and she always dreaded being a hindrance to him in such matters. To Pierre's timid look of inquiry after reading the letter she replied by asking him to go, but to fix a definite date for his return. He was given four weeks' leave of absence. Ever since that leave of absence had expired, more than a fortnight. Before, Natasha had been in a constant state of alarm, depression, and irritability. Denisov, now a general on the retired list and much dissatisfied with 
the present state of affairs, had arrived during that fortnight. He looked at Natasha with sorrow and surprise as at a bad likeness of a person once dear. A dull, dejected look, random replies, and talk about. The nursery was all he saw and heard from his former enchantress. Natasha was sad and irritable all that time, especially when her mother, her brother, Sonia, or Countess Mary in their efforts to console her, tried to excuse Pierre and suggested reasons for his delay in returning. It's all nonsense, all rubbish, those discussions which lead to nothing. And all those idiotic societies. Natasha declared of the very affairs. In the immense importance of which she firmly believed. And she would go to the nursery to nurse Petia, her only boy. No one. Else could tell her anything so comforting or so reasonable as this. Little three-month-old creature when he lay at her breast and she was. Conscious of the movement of his lips and the snuffling of his little. Nose. That creature said, you are angry, you are jealous, you would. Like to pay him out, you are afraid, but here am I. And I am he, and. That was unanswerable. It was more than true. During that fortnight of anxiety Natasha resorted to the baby for. Comfort so often, and fussed over him so much, that she overfed him and. He fell ill. She was terrified by his illness, and yet that was just what she needed. While attending to him she bore the anxiety about her husband more easily. She was nursing her boy when the sound of Pierre's sleigh was heard. At the front door, and the old nurse, knowing how to please her mistress, entered the room inaudibly but hurriedly and with a beaming face. Has he come? Natasha asked quickly in a whisper, afraid to move lest she should rouse the dozing baby. He's come, ma'am, whispered the nurse. The blood rushed to Natasha's face and her feet involuntarily moved, but she could not jump up and run out. The baby again opened his eyes and looked at her. You're here, he seemed to be saying, and again lazily smacked his lips. Cautiously withdrawing her breast, Natasha rocked him a little, handed him to the nurse, and went with rapid steps toward the door. But at the door she stopped as if her conscience reproached her for having in. Her joy left the child too soon, and she glanced round. The nurse with raised elbows was lifting the infant over the rail of his cot. Go, ma'am. Don't worry, go she whispered, smiling, with the kind of familiarity that grows up between a nurse and her mistress. Natasha ran with light footsteps to the anteroom. Denisov, who had come out of the study into the dancing room with his pipe, now for the first time recognized the old Natasha. A flood of brilliant, joyful light poured from her transfigured face. He's come, she exclaimed as she ran past, and Denisov felt that he too was delighted that Pierre, whom he did not much care for, had returned. On reaching the vestibule Natasha saw a tall figure in a fur coat. Unwinding his scarf. It's he. It's really he. He has come, she said. To herself, and rushing at him embraced him, pressed his head to her. Breast, and then pushed him back and gazed at his ruddy, happy face. Covered with hoarfrost. Yes, it is he, happy and contented. Then all at once she remembered the tortures of suspense she had. Experienced for the last fortnight, and the joy that had lit up her. Face vanished, she frowned and overwhelmed Pierre with a torrent of. Reproaches and angry words. Yes, it's all very well for you. You are pleased, you've had a good time. But what about me? You might at least have shown consideration. For the children. I am nursing and my milk was spoiled. Petia was at death's door. But you were enjoying yourself. Yes, enjoying. 
Pierre knew he was not to blame, for he could not have come sooner, he knew this outburst was unseemly and would blow over in a minute or two. Above all he knew that he himself was bright and happy. He wanted to smile but dared not even think of doing so. He made a piteous, frightened face and bent down. I could not, on my honor. But how is Petia? All right now. Come along. I wonder you're not ashamed. If only you could see what I was like without you, how I suffered. You are well? Come, come, she said, not letting go of his arm. And they went to their rooms. When Nicholas and his wife came to look for Pierre he was in the nursery. Holding his baby son, who was again awake, on his huge right palm and dandling him. A blissful bright smile was fixed on the baby's broad face. With its toothless open mouth. The storm was long since over and there. Was bright, joyous sunshine on Natasha's face as she gazed tenderly at. Her husband and child. And have you talked everything well over with Prince Theodore, she. Asked. Yes, capitally. You see, he holds it up. She meant the baby's head. But how he did. Frighten me. You've seen the princess. Is it true she's in love with. That. Yes, just fancy. At that moment Nicholas and Countess Mary came in. Pierre with the baby. On his hand stooped, kissed them, and replied to their inquiries. But. In spite of much that was interesting and had to be discussed, the baby, with the little cap on its unsteady head evidently absorbed all his attention. How sweet, said Countess Mary, looking at and playing with the baby. Now, Nicholas, she added, turning to her husband, I can't understand how it is you don't see the charm of these delicious marvels. I don't and can't, replied Nicholas, looking coldly at the baby. A lump of flesh. Come along, Pierre. And yet he's such an affectionate father, said Countess Mary. Vindicating her husband, but only after they are a year old or so. Now, Pierre nurses them splendidly, said Natasha. He says his hand is. Just made for a baby's seat. Just look. Only not for this, Pierre suddenly exclaimed with a laugh, and. Shifting the baby he gave him to the nurse. Chapter 349 As in every large household, there were at Bald Hills several perfectly distinct worlds which merged into one harmonious whole, though each retained its own peculiarities and made concessions to the others. Every event, joyful or sad, that took place in that house was important to all. These worlds, but each had its own special reasons to rejoice or grieve over that occurrence independently of the others. For instance, Pierre's return was a joyful and important event and they all felt it to be so. The servants, the most reliable judges of their masters because they judge not by their conversation or expressions of feeling but by their acts and way of life, were glad of Pierre's return because they knew that when he was there Count Nicholas would cease going every day to attend to the estate, and would be in better spirits and temper, and also because they would all receive handsome presents for the holidays. The children and their governesses were glad of Pierre's return because no one else drew them into the social life of the household as he did. He alone could play on the clavichord that Ecossais, his only piece. To which, as he said, all possible dances could be danced, and they felt sure he had brought presents for them all. Young Nicholas, now a slim lad of fifteen, delicate and intelligent, with curly light brown hair and beautiful eyes, was delighted because Uncle Pierre as he called him was the object of his rapturous and passionate affection. No one had instilled into him this love for Pierre whom he saw only occasionally. 
Countess Mary who had brought him up, had done her utmost to make him love her husband as she loved him, and little Nicholas did love his uncle, but loved him with just a shade of contempt. Pierre, however, he adored. He did not want to be an hussar or a knight of St. George like his uncle Nicholas, he wanted to be learned, wise, and kind like Pierre. In Pierre's presence his face always shone with pleasure and he flushed and was breathless when Pierre spoke to him. He did not miss a single word he uttered, and would afterwards, with Dassault's or by himself, recall and reconsider the meaning of everything Pierre had said. Pierre's past life and his unhappiness prior to 1812, of which young Nicholas had formed a vague poetic picture from some words he had overheard, his adventures in Moscow, his captivity. Platon Karatev, of whom he had heard from Pierre, his love for Natasha. Of whom the lad was also particularly fond, and especially Pierre's. Friendship with the father whom Nicholas could not remember, all this. Made Pierre in his eyes a hero and a saint. From broken remarks about Natasha and his father, from the emotion with which Pierre spoke of that dead father, and from the careful, reverent tenderness with which Natasha spoke of him, the boy, who was only just beginning to guess what love is, derived the notion that his father had loved Natasha and when dying had left her to his friend. But the father, whom the boy did not remember appeared to him a divinity who could not be pictured, and of whom he never thought without a swelling heart and tears of sadness and rapture. So the boy also was happy that Pierre had arrived. The guests welcomed Pierre because he always helped to enliven and unite any company he was in. The grown-up members of the family, not to mention his wife, were pleased to have back a friend whose presence made life run more smoothly and peacefully. The old ladies were pleased with the presents he brought them, and especially that Natasha would now be herself again. Pierre felt the different outlooks of these various worlds and made haste to satisfy all their expectations. Though the most absent-minded and forgetful of men, Pierre, with the aid of a list his wife drew up, had now bought everything, not forgetting his mother and brother-in-law's commissions, nor the dress material for a present to Belova, nor toys for his wife's nephews. In the early days of his marriage it had seemed strange to him that his wife should expect him not to forget to procure all the things he undertook to buy, and he had been taken aback by her serious annoyance when on his first trip he forgot everything. But in time he grew used to this demand. Knowing that Natasha asked nothing for herself, and gave him commissions for others. Only when he himself had offered to undertake them, he now found an unexpected and childlike pleasure in this purchase of presents for everyone in the house, and never forgot anything. If he now incurred Natasha's censure it was only for buying too many and too expensive things to her other defects, as most people thought them, but which to Pierre were qualities, of untidiness and neglect of herself, she now added stinginess. From the time that Pierre began life as a family man on a footing, entailing heavy expenditure, he had noticed to his surprise that he spent only half as much as before, and that his affairs, which had been in disorder of late, chiefly because of his first wife's debts, had begun to improve. Life was cheaper because it was circumscribed, that most expensive. Luxury, the kind of life that can be changed at any moment, was no longer his nor did he wish for it. He felt that his way of life had now been settled once for all till death and that to change it was not in his power, and so that way of life proved economical. With a merry, smiling face Pierre was sorting his purchases. What do you think of this, said he, unrolling a piece of stuff like a 
Shopman. Natasha, who was sitting opposite to him with her eldest daughter on her lap, turned her sparkling eyes swiftly from her husband to the things he showed her. That's for Belova? Excellent. She felt the quality of the material. It was a ruble and arshan, I suppose? Pierre told her the price. Too dear. Natasha remarked. How pleased the children will be and. Mama too. Only you need not have bought me this, she added, unable to. Suppress a smile as she gazed admiringly at a gold comb set with pearls. Of a kind then just coming into fashion. Adele tempted me, she kept on telling me to buy it, returned Pierre. When am I to wear it, and Natasha stuck it in her coil of hair. When? I take little Masha into society? Perhaps they will be fashionable again. By then. Well, let's go now. And collecting the presents they went first to the nursery and then to the old countess rooms. The countess was sitting with her companion Belova, playing. Grand patience as usual, when Pierre and Natasha came into the drawing. Room with parcels under their arms. The countess was now over sixty, was quite grey, and wore a cap with a frill that surrounded her face. Her face had shriveled, her upper lip had sunk in, and her eyes were dim. After the deaths of her son and husband in such rapid succession, she felt herself a being accidentally forgotten in this world and left without aim or object for her existence. She ate, drank, slept, or kept awake, but did not live. Life gave her no new impressions. She wanted nothing from life but tranquility, and that tranquility only death could give her. But until death came she had to go on living, that is, to use her vital forces. A peculiarity one sees in very young children. And very old people was particularly evident in her. Her life had no external aims, only a need to exercise her various functions and inclinations was apparent. She had to eat, sleep, think, speak, weep, work, give vent to her anger, and so on, merely because she had a stomach, a brain, muscles, nerves, and a liver. She did these things not under any external impulse as people in the full vigor of life do when behind the purpose for which they strive that of exercising their functions remains unnoticed. She talked only because she physically needed to exercise her tongue and lungs. She cried as a child does, because her nose had to be cleared, and so on. What for people in there? Full vigor is an aim was for her evidently merely a pretext. Thus in the morning, especially if she had eaten anything rich the day. Before, she felt a need of being angry and would choose as the handiest. Pretext Belova's deafness. She would begin to say something to her in a low tone from the other end. Of the room. It seems a little warmer today, my dear, she would murmur. And when Belova replied, oh yes, they've come, she would mutter. Angrily, oh lord. How stupid and deaf she is. Another pretext would be her snuff, which would seem too dry or too damp. Or not rubbed fine enough. After these fits of irritability her face. Would grow yellow, and her maids knew by infallible symptoms when Belova. Would again be deaf, the snuff damp, and the countess face yellow. Just. As she needed to work off her spleen so she had sometimes to exercise her still existing faculty of thinking, and the pretext for that was a game of patience. When she needed to cry, the deceased count would be the pretext. When she wanted to be agitated, Nicholas and his health would be the pretext, and when she felt a need to speak spitefully, the pretext would be Countess Mary. When her vocal organs needed exercise, which was usually toward seven o'clock when she had had an after-dinner 
Rest in a darkened room, the pretext would be the retelling of the same. Stories over and over again to the same audience. The old lady's condition was understood by the whole household though no. One ever spoke of it, and they all made every possible effort to satisfy. Her needs. Only by a rare glance exchanged with a sad smile. Between Nicholas, Pierre, Natasha, and Countess Mary was the common. Understanding of her condition expressed. But those glances expressed something more, they said that she had. Played her part in life, that what they now saw was not her whole self. That we must all become like her, and that they were glad to yield to. Her, to restrain themselves for this once precious being formerly as. Full of life as themselves, but now so much to be pitted. Memento. Mori, said these glances. Only the really heartless, the stupid ones of that household, and the. Little children failed to understand this and avoided her. Chapter 350 When Pierre and his wife entered the drawing room the countess was in. One of her customary states in which she needed the mental exertion of. Playing patience, and so, though by force of habit she greeted him with. The word she always used when Pierre or her son returned after an. Absence, high time, my dear, high time. We were all weary of waiting. For you. Well, thank God, and received her presence with another. Customary remark, it's not the gift that's precious, my dear, but that. You give it to me, an old woman, yet it was evident that she was. Not pleased by Pierre's arrival at that moment when it diverted her. Attention from the unfinished game. She finished her game of patience and only then examined the presence. They consisted of a box for cards, of splendid workmanship, a bright blue Sevres teacup with shepherdesses depicted on it and with a lid, and a gold snuffbox with the Count's portrait on the lid which Pierre had had done by a miniaturist in Petersburg. The Countess had long wished for such a box, but as she did not want to cry just then she glanced indifferently at the portrait and gave her attention chiefly to the box for cards. Thank you, my dear, you have cheered me up, said she as she always did, but best of all you have brought yourself back, for I never saw anything like it, you ought to give your wife a scolding. What are we to do with her? She is like a mad woman when you are away. Doesn't see anything, doesn't remember anything, she went on, repeating her usual phrases. Look, Anna Timofeevna, she added to her companion, see what. A box for cards my son has brought us. Belova admired the presents and was delighted with her dress material. Though Pierre, Natasha, Nicholas, Countess Mary, and Denisov had much to talk about that they could not discuss before the old countess, not that anything was hidden from her, but because she had dropped so far behindhand in many things that had they begun to converse in her presence they would have had to answer inopportune questions and to repeat what they had already told her many times, that so-and-so was dead and so-and-so was married, which she would again be unable to remember, yet they sat at tea round the samovar in the drawing room from habit, and Pierre answered the countess' questions as to whether Prince Vasily had aged and whether Countess Mary Alexeevna had sent greetings. And still thought of them, and other matters that interested no one and. To which she herself was indifferent. Conversation of this kind, interesting to no one yet unavoidable. Continued all through tea time. All the grown-up members of the family. Were assembled near the round tea table at which Sonia presided beside. The samovar. The children with their tutors and governesses had had tea and their voices were audible from the next room. At tea all sat. In their accustomed places, Nicholas beside the stove at a small table. Where his tea was handed to him, Milka, the old grey borzoi bitch. Daughter of the first Milka, with a quite grey face and large black 
eyes that seemed more prominent than ever, lay on the armchair beside him, Denisov, whose curly hair, mustache, and whiskers had turned half gray, sat beside Countess Mary with his general's tunic unbuttoned. Pierre sat between his wife and the old countess. He spoke of what he knew might interest the old lady and that she could understand. He told her of external social events and of the people who had formed the circle of her contemporaries and had once been a real, living, and distinct group, but who were now for the most part scattered about the world and like herself were garnering the last ears of the harvests they had sown in earlier years. But to the old countess those contemporaries of hers seemed to be the only serious and real society. Natasha saw by Pierre's animation that his visit had been interesting and that he had much to tell them but dare not say it before the old countess. Denisov, not being a member of the family, did not understand Pierre's caution. And being, as a malcontent, much interested in what was occurring in Petersburg, kept urging Pierre to tell them about what had happened in the Semenovsk regiment, then about Arakchev, and then about the Bible. Society. Once or twice Pierre was carried away and began to speak of these things, but Nicholas and Natasha always brought him back to the health of Prince Ivan and Countess Mary Alexeevna. Well, and all this idiocy, Gosner and Tatawinova? Denisov asked. Is that really still going on? Going on? Pierre exclaimed. Why more than ever? The Bible Society is the whole government now. What is that, mon cher ami, asked the countess, who had finished her tea and evidently needed a pretext for being angry after her meal. What are you saying about the government? I don't understand. Well, you know, maman, Nicholas interposed, knowing how to translate things into his mother's language, Prince Alexander Galitsyn has founded a society and in consequence has great influence, they say. Arakchev and Galitsyn, incautiously remarked Pierre, are now the whole government. And what a government! They see treason everywhere and are afraid of everything. Well, and how is Prince Alexander to blame? He is a most estimable man. I used to meet him at Mary Antonovna's, said the countess in an offended tone, and still more offended that they all remained silent. She went on, nowadays everyone finds fault. A gospel society. Well, and what harm is there in that, and she rose, everybody else got up too. And with a severe expression sailed back to her table in the sitting. Room. The melancholy silence that followed was broken by the sounds of the children's voices and laughter from the next room. Evidently some jolly excitement was going on there. Finished, finished, little Natasha's gleeful yell rose above them all. Pierre exchanged glances with Countess Mary and Nicholas, Natasha he never lost sight of, and smiled happily. That's delightful music, said he. It means that Anna Makarovna has finished her stocking, said Countess. Mary. Oh, I'll go and see, said Pierre, jumping up. You know, he added. Stopping at the door, why I'm especially fond of that music. It is. Always the first thing that tells me all is well. When I was driving. Here today, the nearer I got to the house the more anxious I grew. As I. Entered the anteroom I heard Andrusha's peals of laughter and that meant. That all was well. I know. I know that feeling, said Nicholas. But I mustn't go. There, those stockings are to be a surprise for me. Pierre went to the children, and the shouting and laughter grew still. Louder. Come, Anna Makarovna, Pierre's voice was heard saying, come here into. The middle of the room and at the word of command, one, two, and 
When I say, three. You stand here, and you in my arms, well now. One. Two, said Pierre, and a silence followed, three, and a rapturously. Breathless cry of children's voices filled the room. Two, two, they. Shouted. This meant two stockings, which by a secret process known only to herself Anna Makarovna used to knit at the same time on the same needles, and which, when they were ready, she always triumphantly drew one out of the other, in the children's presence. Chapter 351 Soon after this the children came in to say good night. They kissed. Everyone, the tutors and governesses made their bows, and they went out. Only young Nicholas and his tutor remained. Dessals whispered to the boy to come downstairs. No, Monsieur Dessals, I will ask my aunt to let me stay, replied. Nicholas Bolkonsky also in a whisper. Ma tante, please let me stay, said he, going up to his aunt. His face expressed entreaty, agitation, and ecstasy. Countess Mary glanced at him and turned to Pierre. When you are here he can't tear himself away, she said. I will bring him to you directly, Monsieur de Salles. Good night, said Pierre, giving his hand to the Swiss tutor, and he turned to young. Nicholas with a smile. You and I haven't seen anything of one another. Yet. How like he is growing, Mary, he added, addressing Countess. Mary. Like my father, asked the boy, flushing crimson and looking up at Pierre with bright, ecstatic eyes. Pierre nodded, and went on with what he had been saying when the children had interrupted. Countess Mary sat down doing woolwork, Natasha did not take her eyes off her husband. Nicholas and Denisov rose, asked for their pipes, smoked, went to fetch more tea from Sonia who sat weary, but resolute at the samovar, and questioned Pierre. The curly-headed, delicate boy sat with shining eyes unnoticed in a corner, starting every now and then and muttering something to himself, and evidently experiencing a new and powerful emotion as he turned his curly head, with his thin neck exposed by his turned-down collar, toward the place where Pierre sat. The conversation turned on the contemporary gossip about those in power, in which most people see the chief interest of home politics. Denisov, dissatisfied with the government on account of his own disappointments, in the service, heard with pleasure of the things done in Petersburg, which seemed to him stupid, and made forcible and sharp comments on what Pierre told them. One used to have to be a German, now one must dance with Tatuinova. And Madame Quidner, and we'd Eckert Shazen and the Bwethwen. Oh, they. Should let that fine fellow Bonaparte loose, he'd knock all this nonsense. Out of them. Fancy giving the command of the Semenov Wegiment to a. Fellow like that Schwatizi, he cried. Nicholas, though free from Denisov's readiness to find fault with. Everything, also thought that discussion of the government was a very serious and weighty matter, and the fact that A had been appointed minister of this and be governor-general of that, and that the emperor had said so-and-so and this minister so-and-so, seemed to him very important. And so he thought it necessary to take an interest in these things and to question Pierre. The questions put by these two kept the Conversation from changing its ordinary character of gossip about the higher government circles. But Natasha, knowing all her husband's ways and ideas, saw that he had long been wishing but had been unable to divert the conversation to another channel and express his own deeply felt idea for the sake of which he had gone to Petersburg to consult with his new friend Prince Theodore and she helped him by asking how his affairs with Prince Theodore had gone. What was it about? asked Nicholas. Always the same thing, said Pierre, looking round at his listeners. 
Everybody sees that things are going so badly that they cannot be allowed to go on so and that it is the duty of all decent men to counteract it as far as they can. What can decent men do? Nicholas inquired, frowning slightly. What can be done? Why, this? Come into my study, said Nicholas. Natasha, who had long expected to be fetched to nurse her baby, now heard the nurse calling her and went to the nursery. Countess Mary followed her. The men went into the study and little Nicholas Bolkonsky followed them unnoticed by his uncle and sat down at the writing table in a shady corner by the window. Well, what would you do? asked Denisov. Always some fantastic schemes, said Nicholas. Why this? began Pierre, not sitting down but pacing the room. Sometimes stopping short, gesticulating, and lisping, the position. In Petersburg is this, the emperor does not look into anything. He has abandoned himself altogether to this mysticism, Pierre could not tolerate mysticism in anyone now. He seeks only for peace, and only. These people sans foi and I loy asterisk can give it him, people who recklessly hack at and strangle everything, Magnitsky, Arakchev, and Tutti. Quanti. You will agree that if you did not look after your estates yourself but only wanted a quiet life, the harsher your steward was the more readily your object might be attained, he said to Nicholas. Asterisk without faith or law. Well, what does that lead up to, said Nicholas. Well, everything is going to ruin. Robbery in the law courts, in the army nothing but flogging, drilling, and military settlements, the people are tortured, enlightenment is suppressed. All that is young and honest is crushed. Everyone sees that this cannot go on. Everything is strained to such a degree that it will certainly break, said Pierre, as those who examine the actions of any government have always said since governments began. I told them just one thing in Petersburg. Told whom? Well, you know whom, said Pierre, with a meaning glance from under his brows. Prince Theodore and all those to encourage culture and Philanthropy is all very well of course. The aim is excellent but in the present circumstances something else is needed. At that moment Nicholas noticed the presence of his nephew. His face darkened and he went up to the boy. Why are you here? Why? Let him be, said Pierre, taking Nicholas by the arm and continuing. That is not enough, I told them. Something else is needed. When you stand expecting the overstrained string to snap at any moment. When everyone is expecting the inevitable catastrophe, as many as possible must join hands as closely as they can to withstand the general calamity. Everything that is young and strong is being enticed away and depraved. One is lured by women, another by honors, a third by ambition or money, and they go over to that camp. No independent men, such as you, or I, are left. What I say is widen the scope of our society, let the MOTD order be not virtue alone but independence and action as well. Nicholas, who had left his nephew, irritably pushed up an armchair, sat down in it, and listened to Pierre, coughing discontentedly and frowning more and more. But action with what aim, he cried. And what position will you adopt? Toward the government? Why, the position of assistance. The society need not be secret if the government allows it. Not merely is it not hostile to government, but it is a society of true conservatives, a society of gentlemen in the full meaning of that word. It is only to prevent some Pugachev or other from killing my children and yours, and Arakchev from sending me off to some 
military settlement. We join hands only for the public welfare and the general safety. Yes, but it's a secret society and therefore a hostile and harmful one. Which can only cause harm. Why? Did the Tugendbund which saved Europe, they did not then venture. To suggest that Russia had saved Europe, do any harm? The Tugendbund is an alliance of virtue, it is love, mutual help, it is what Christ preached on the cross. Natasha, who had come in during the conversation, looked joyfully at her husband. It was not what he was saying that pleased her, that did not even interest her, for it seemed to her that was all extremely simple. And that she had known it a long time, it seemed so to her because she knew that it sprang from Pierre's whole soul, but it was his animated and enthusiastic appearance that made her glad. The boy with the thin neck stretching out from the turned-down collar, whom everyone had forgotten, gazed at Pierre with even greater and more rapturous joy. Every word of Pierre's burned into his heart, and with a nervous movement of his fingers he unconsciously broke the sealing wax. And quill pens his hands came upon on his uncle's table. It is not at all what you suppose, but that is what the German Tugendbund was, and what I am proposing. No, my fiend. The Tugendbund is all viewy well for the sausage eaters. But I don't understand it and can't even pronounce it, interposed. Denisov in a loud and resolute voice. I agree that everything here is. Watten and howable, but the Tugendbund I don't understand. If we're not satisfied, let us have a bund of our own. That's all white. Je suis. Vote um. Asterisk. Asterisk, I'm your man. Pierre smiled, Natasha began to laugh, but Nicholas knitted his brows. Still more and began proving to Pierre that there was no prospect of any great change and that all the danger he spoke of existed only in his imagination. Pierre maintained the contrary, and as his mental faculties were greater and more resourceful, Nicholas felt himself cornered. This made him still angrier, for he was fully convinced, not by reasoning, but by something within him stronger than reason, of the justice of his opinion. I will tell you this, he said, rising and trying with nervously, twitching fingers to prop up his pipe in a corner, but finally, abandoning the attempt. I can't prove it to you. You say that. Everything here is rotten and that an overthrow is coming, I don't. See it. But you also say that our oath of allegiance is a conditional. Matter, and to that I reply, you are my best friend, as you know. But if you formed a secret society and began working against the government, be it what it may, I know it is my duty to obey the government. And if Arakshiv ordered me to lead a squadron against you and cut you down, should not hesitate an instant, but should do it. And you may argue about that as you like. An awkward silence followed these words. Natasha was the first to speak. Defending her husband and attacking her brother. Her defense was weak. And inapt but she attained her object. The conversation was resumed, and. No longer in the unpleasantly hostile tone of Nicholas' last remark. When they all got up to go into supper, little Nicholas Bolkonsky went. Up to Pierre, pale and with shining, radiant eyes. Uncle Pierre, you, know. If Papa were alive, would he agree with? You, he asked. And Pierre suddenly realized what a special, independent, complex, and powerful process of thought and feeling must have been going on in. This boy during that conversation, and remembering all he had said he regretted that the lad should have heard him. He had, however, to give him an answer. Yes, I think so, he said reluctantly, and left the study. 
The lad looked down and seemed now for the first time to notice what he had done to the things on the table. He flushed and went up to Nicholas. Uncle, forgive me, I did that, unintentionally, he said, pointing to the broken sealing wax and pens. Nicholas started angrily. All right, all right, he said, throwing the bits under the table. And evidently suppressing his vexation with difficulty, he turned away. From the boy. You ought not to have been here at all, he said. Chapter 352 The conversation at supper was not about politics or societies, but turned on the subject Nicholas liked best, recollections of 1812. Denisov started these and Pierre was particularly agreeable and amusing about them. The family separated on the most friendly terms. After supper Nicholas, having undressed in his study and given instructions to the steward who had been waiting for him, went to the bedroom in his dressing gown, where he found his wife still at her table, writing. What are you writing, Mary? Nicholas asked. Countess Mary blushed. She was afraid that what she was writing would not be understood or approved by her husband. She had wanted to conceal what she was writing from him, but at the same time was glad he had surprised her at it and that she would now have to tell him. A diary, Nicholas, she replied, handing him a blue exercise book. Filled with her firm, bold writing. A diary? Nicholas repeated with a shade of irony, and he took up the book. It was in French. December 4th. Today when Andrusha, her eldest boy, woke up he did not wish to dress and Mademoiselle Louise sent for me. He was naughty and obstinate. I tried threats, but he only grew angrier. Then I took the matter in hand, I left him alone and began with nurse's help to get the other children up, telling him that I did not love him for a long time. He was silent, as if astonished, then he jumped out of bed, ran to me in his shirt, and sobbed so that I could not calm him for a long time. It was plain that what troubled him most was that he had grieved me. Afterwards in the evening when I gave him his ticket, he again began crying piteously and kissing me. One can do anything with him by tenderness. What is a ticket? Nicholas inquired. I have begun giving the elder ones marks every evening, showing how they have behaved. Nicholas looked into the radiant eyes that were gazing at him, and continued to turn over the pages and read. In the diary was set down. Everything in the children's lives that seemed noteworthy to their mother as showing their characters or suggesting general reflections on educational methods. They were for the most part quite insignificant. Trifles, but did not seem so to the mother or to the father either, now. That he read this diary about his children for the first time. Under the date, five, was entered. Mitya was naughty at table. Papa said he was to have no pudding. He had. None, but looked so unhappily and greedily at the others while they were. Eating. I think that punishment by depriving children of sweets only develops their greediness. Must tell Nicholas this. Nicholas put down the book and looked at his wife. The radiant eyes gazed at him questioningly, would he approve or disapprove of her? Diary? There could be no doubt not only of his approval but also of his admiration for his wife. Perhaps it need not be done so pedantically, thought Nicholas, or even done at all, but this untiring, continual spiritual effort of which the sole aim was the children's moral welfare delighted him. Had Nicholas been able to analyze his feelings he would have found that his steady, tender, and proud love of his wife rested on his feeling of wonder at her spirituality and at the lofty moral world, almost beyond his reach, in which she had her being. 
He was proud of her intelligence and goodness, recognized his own insignificance beside her in the spiritual world, and rejoiced all the more that she with such a soul not only belonged to him but was part of himself. I quite, quite approve, my dearest, said he with a significant look. And after a short pause he added, and I behaved badly today. You weren't in the study. We began disputing, Pierre and I, and I lost my temper. But he is impossible, such a child. I don't know what would become of him if Natasha didn't keep him in hand. Have you any idea why he went to Petersburg? They have formed. Yes, I know, said Countess Mary. Natasha told me. Well, then, you know, Nicholas went on, growing hot at the mere recollection of their discussion, he wanted to convince me that it is every honest man's duty to go against the government, and that the oath of allegiance and duty. I am sorry you weren't there. They all fell on me, Denisov and Natasha. Natasha is absurd. How she rules over him. And yet there need only be a discussion and she has no words of her own. But only repeats his sayings, added Nicholas, yielding to that irresistible inclination which tempts us to judge those nearest and dearest to us. He forgot that what he was saying about Natasha could have been applied word for word to himself in relation to his wife. Yes, I have noticed that, said Countess Mary. When I told him that duty and the oath were above everything, he started proving goodness knows what. A pity you were not there, what? Would you have said? As I see it you were quite right, and I told Natasha so. Pierre says. Everybody is suffering, tortured, and being corrupted, and that it is our duty to help our neighbor. Of course he is right there, said. Countess Mary, but he forgets that we have other duties nearer to us. Duties indicated to us by God himself, and that though we might expose ourselves to risks we must not risk our children. Yes, that's it. That's just what I said to him, put in Nicholas, who fancied he really had said it. But they insisted on their own view. Love of one's neighbor and Christianity, and all this in the presence of young Nicholas, who had gone into my study and broke all my things. Ah, Nicholas, do you know I am often troubled about little Nicholas? said Countess Mary. He is such an exceptional boy. I am afraid I neglect him in favor of my own, we all have children and relations while he has no one. He is constantly alone with his thoughts. Well, I don't think you need reproach yourself on his account. All that the fondest mother could do for her son you have done and are doing for him, and of course I am glad of it. He is a fine lad, a fine lad. This evening he listened to Pierre in a sort of trance, and fancy, as we were. Going into supper I looked and he had broken everything on my table to bits, and he told me of it himself at once. I never knew him to tell an untruth. A fine lad, a fine lad, repeated Nicholas, who at heart was not fond of Nicholas Bolkonsky but was always anxious to recognize that. He was a fine lad. Still, I am not the same as his own mother, said Countess Mary. I feel I am not the same and it troubles me. A wonderful boy, but I am dreadfully afraid for him. It would be good for him to have companions. Well it won't be for long. Next summer I'll take him to Petersburg said Nicholas. Yes, Pierre always was a dreamer and always will be. He continued, returning to the talk in the study which had evidently disturbed him. Well, what business is it of mine what goes on? There, whether Arakchev is bad, and all that? What business was it of? 
mine when I married and was so deep in debt that I was threatened with prison, and had a mother who could not see or understand it. And then there are you and the children and our affairs. Is it for my own pleasure that I am at the farm or in the office from morning to night? No, but I know I must work to comfort my mother, to repay you, and not to leave the children such beggars as I was. Countess Mary wanted to tell him that man does not live by bread alone, and that he attached too much importance to these matters. But she knew she must not say this and that it would be useless to do so. She only took his hand and kissed it. He took this as a sign of approval and a confirmation of his thoughts, and after a few minutes' reflection, continued to think aloud. You know, Mary, today Elias Mitrofanik, this was his overseer, came back from the Tamboff estate and told me they are already offering eighty thousand rubles for the forest. And with an eager face Nicholas began to speak of the possibility of repurchasing Otradno before long, and added, another ten years of life. And I shall leave the children, in an excellent position. Countess Mary listened to her husband and understood all that he told her. She knew that when he thought aloud in this way he would sometimes ask her what he had been saying, and be vexed if he noticed that she had been thinking about something else. But she had to force herself to attend, for what he was saying did not interest her at all. She looked at him and did not think, but felt, about something different. She felt a submissive tender love for this man who would never understand all that she understood, and this seemed to make her love for him still stronger and added a touch of passionate tenderness. Besides this feeling which absorbed her altogether and hindered her from following the details of her husband's plans, thoughts that had no connection with what he was saying flitted through her mind. She thought of her nephew. Her husband's account of the boy's agitation while Pierre was speaking struck her forcibly, and various traits of his gentle, sensitive character recurred to her mind, and while thinking of her nephew she thought also of her own children. She did not compare them with him, but compared her feeling for them with her feeling for him, and felt with regret that there was something lacking in her feeling for young. Nicholas. Sometimes it seemed to her that this difference arose from the difference in their ages, but she felt herself to blame toward him and promised in her heart to do better and to accomplish the impossible, in this life to love her husband, her children, little Nicholas, and all her neighbors, as Christ loved mankind. Countess Mary's soul always strove toward the infinite, the eternal, and the absolute, and could therefore never be at peace. A stern expression of the lofty, secret suffering of a soul burdened by the body appeared on her face. Nicholas gazed at her. Oh God! What will become of us if she dies, as I always fear when her face is like that, thought he, and placing himself before the icon he began to say his evening prayers. Chapter 353 Natasha and Pierre, left alone, also began to talk as only a husband and wife can talk, that is, with extraordinary clearness and rapidity, understanding and expressing each other's thoughts in ways contrary to all rules of logic, without premises, deductions, or conclusions, and in a quite peculiar way. Natasha was so used to this kind of talk with her husband that for her it was the surest sign of something being wrong. Between them if Pierre followed a line of logical reasoning. When he began proving anything, or talking argumentatively and calmly and she, led on by his example, began to do the same, she knew that they were on the verge of a quarrel. From the moment they were alone and Natasha came up to him with wide open happy eyes, and quickly seizing his head pressed it to her. 
bosom, saying, Now you are all mine, mine. You won't escape. From that moment this conversation began, contrary to all the laws of logic and contrary to them because quite different subjects were talked about at one and the same time. This simultaneous discussion of many topics did not prevent a clear understanding but on the contrary was the surest sign that they fully understood one another. Just as in a dream when all is uncertain, unreasoning, and contradictory, except the feeling that guides the dream, so in this intercourse contrary to all laws of reason, the words themselves were not consecutive and clear but only the feeling that prompted them. Natasha spoke to Pierre about her brother's life and doings, of how she had suffered and lacked life during his own absence, and of how she was fonder than ever of Mary, and how Mary was in every way better than herself. In saying this Natasha was sincere in acknowledging Mary's superiority, but at the same time by saying it she made a demand on Pierre that he should, all the same, prefer her to Mary and to all other women, and that now, especially after having seen many women in Petersburg, he should tell her so afresh. Pierre, answering Natasha's words, told her how intolerable it had been for him to meet ladies at dinners and balls in Petersburg. I have quite lost the knack of talking to ladies, he said. It was simply dull. Besides, I was very busy. Natasha looked intently at him and went on. Mary is so splendid, she said. How she understands children. It is as if she saw straight into their souls. Yesterday, for instance, Mitya was naughty. How like his father he is, Pierre interjected. Natasha knew why he mentioned Mitya's likeness to Nicholas, the recollection of his dispute with his brother-in-law was unpleasant and he wanted to know what Natasha thought of it. Nicholas has the weakness of never agreeing with anything not generally accepted. But I understand that you value what opens up a fresh line. Said she, repeating words Pierre had once uttered. No, the chief point is that to Nicholas ideas and discussions are an amusement, almost a pastime, said Pierre. For instance, he is collecting a library and has made it a rule not to buy a new book. Till he has read what he had already bought, Sismondi and Rousseau and Montesquieu, he added with a smile. You know how much I, he began. To soften down what he had said, but Natasha interrupted him to show. That this was unnecessary. So you say ideas are an amusement to him. Yes, and for me nothing else is serious. All the time in Petersburg I. Saw everyone as in a dream. When I am taken up by a thought, all else is. Mere amusement. Ah, I'm so sorry I wasn't there when you met the children, said. Natasha. Which was most delighted. Lisa, I'm sure. Yes, Pierre replied, and went on with what was in his mind. Nicholas. Says we ought not to think. But I can't help it. Besides, when I was in. Petersburg I felt, I can say this to you that the whole affair would go to pieces without me, everyone was pulling his own way. But I succeeded in uniting them all, and then my idea is so clear and simple. You see, I don't say that we ought to oppose this and that. We may be mistaken. What I say is, join hands, you who love the right, and let there be but one banner, that of active virtue. Prince Sergei is a fine fellow and clever. Natasha would have had no doubt as to the greatness of Pierre's idea. But one thing disconcerted her. Can a man so important and necessary to society be also my husband? How did this happen? She wished to express this doubt to him. Now who could decide whether he is really cleverer? 
Then all the others, she asked herself, and passed in review all those. Whom Pierre most respected. Judging by what he had said there was no one. He had respected so highly as Platon Karatev. Do you know what I am thinking about? she asked. About Platon. Karatev. Would he have approved of you now, do you think? Pierre was not at all surprised at this question. He understood his wife's line of thought. Platon Karatev, he repeated, and pondered, evidently sincerely. Trying to imagine Karatev's opinion on the subject. He would not have understood, yet perhaps he would. I love you awfully. Natasha suddenly said. Awfully, awfully. No, he would not have approved, said Pierre, after reflection. What? He would have approved of is our family life. He was always so anxious. To find seemliness, happiness, and peace in everything, and I should. Have been proud to let him see us. There now, you talk of my absence. But you wouldn't believe what a special feeling I have for you after a separation. Yes, I should think, Natasha began. No, it's not that. I never leave off loving you. And one couldn't love. More, but this is something special. Yes, of course, he did not. Finish because their eyes meeting said the rest. What nonsense it is, Natasha suddenly exclaimed, about honeymoons. And that the greatest happiness is at first. On the contrary, now is. The best of all. If only you did not go away. Do you remember how? We quarreled. And it was always my fault. Always mine. And what we. Quarreled about, I don't even remember. Always about the same thing, said Pierre with a smile. Jello. Don't say it. I can't bear it. Natasha cried, and her eyes glittered. Coldly and vindicatively. Did you see her? she added, after a pause. No, and if I had I shouldn't have recognized her. They were silent for a while. Oh, do you know? While you were talking in the study I was looking at. You, Natasha began, evidently anxious to disperse the cloud that had come over them. You are as like him as two peas, like the boy. She meant her little son. Oh, it's time to go to him. The milks. Come. But I'm sorry to leave you. They were silent for a few seconds. Then suddenly turning to one. Another at the same time they both began to speak. Pierre began with. Self-satisfaction and enthusiasm, Natasha with a quiet, happy smile. Having interrupted one another they both stopped to let the other. Continue. No. What did you say? Go on, go on. No, you go on, I was talking nonsense, said Natasha. Pierre finished what he had begun. It was the sequel to his complacent. Reflections on his success in Petersburg. At that moment it seemed to. Him that he was chosen to give a new direction to the whole of Russian. Society and to the whole world. I only wish to say that ideas that have great results are always. Simple ones. My whole idea is that if vicious people are united and. Constitute a power then honest folk must do the same. Now that's simple. Enough. Yes. And what were you going to say? I. Only nonsense. But all the same. Oh nothing, only a trifle, said Natasha, smiling still more brightly. I only wanted to tell you about Pedia, today nurse was coming to take. Him from me, and he laughed, shut his eyes, and clung to me. I'm sure. He thought he was hiding. Awfully sweet. There, now he's crying. Well. Goodbye, and she left the room. Meanwhile downstairs in young Nicholas Bolkonsky's bedroom a little lamp. 
was burning as usual. The boy was afraid of the dark and they could not cure him of it. Desal slept propped up on four pillows and his Roman nose emitted sounds of rhythmic snoring. Little Nicholas, who had just waked up in a cold perspiration, sat up in bed and gazed before him. With wide open eyes. He had awaked from a terrible dream. He had dreamed that he and Uncle Pierre, wearing helmets such as were depicted in his Plutarch, were leading a huge army. The army was made up of white slanting lines that filled the air like the cobwebs that float about in autumn and which Dessals called Les Fils de la Vierge. In front was glory, which was similar to those threads but rather thicker. He and Pierre were borne along lightly and joyously, nearer and nearer to their goal. Suddenly the threads that moved them began to slacken and become entangled and it grew difficult to move. And Uncle Nicholas stood before them in a stern and threatening attitude. Have you done this? he said, pointing to some broken sealing wax and pens. I loved you. But I have orders from Arakchiv and will kill the first of you who moves forward. Little Nicholas turned to look at Pierre, but Pierre was no longer there. In his place was his father, Prince Andrew, and his father had neither shape nor form, but he existed, and when little Nicholas perceived him, he grew faint with love. He felt himself powerless, limp, and formless. His father caressed and pitted him. But Uncle Nicholas came nearer and nearer to them. Terror seized young Nicholas and he awoke. My father, he thought. Though there were two good portraits of Prince Andrew in the house, Nicholas never imagined him in human form. My father has been with me and caressed me. He approved of me and of Uncle. Pierre. Whatever he may tell me, I will do it. Musius Sivola burned. His hand. Why should not the same sort of thing happen to me? I know. They want me to learn. And I will learn. But someday I shall have. Finished learning, and then I will do something. I only pray God that. Something may happen to me such as happened to Plutarch's men, and I will act as they did. I will do better. Everyone shall know me, love me, and be delighted with me. And suddenly his bosom heaved with sobs and he began to cry. Are you ill? He heard Dessal's voice asking. No, answered Nicholas, and lay back on his pillow. He is good and kind and I am fond of him, he thought of Dessal's. But Uncle Pierre, Oh, what a wonderful man he is. And my father? Oh. Father, father. Yes, I will do something with which even he would be. Satisfied. Second Epilogue. Chapter 354. History is the life of nations and of humanity. To seize and put into. Words, to describe directly the life of humanity or even of a single. Nation, appears impossible. The ancient historians all employed one and the same method to describe. And seize the apparently elusive, the life of a people. They described. The activity of individuals who ruled the people, and regarded the. Activity of those men as representing the activity of the whole nation. The question, how did individuals make nations act as they wished and by. What was the will of these individuals themselves guided? The ancients met by recognizing a divinity which subjected the nations to the will of a chosen man, and guided the will of that chosen man so as to accomplish ends that were predestined. For the ancients these questions were solved by a belief in the direct participation of the deity in human affairs. Modern history, in theory, rejects both these principles. It would seem that having rejected the belief of the ancients in man's 
subjection to the deity and in a predetermined aim toward which nations are led, modern history should study not the manifestations of power but the causes that produce it. But modern history has not done this. Having in theory rejected the view held by the ancients, it still follows them. In practice, instead of men endowed with divine authority and directly guided by the will of God, modern history has given us either heroes endowed with extraordinary, superhuman capacities, or simply men of very various kinds, from monarchs to journalists, who lead the masses. Instead of the former divinely appointed aims of the Jewish, Greek, or Roman nations, which ancient historians regarded as representing the progress of humanity, modern history has postulated its own aims, the welfare of the French, German, or English people, or, in its highest abstraction, the welfare and civilization of humanity in general, by which is usually meant that of the peoples occupying a small northwesterly portion of a large continent. Modern history has rejected the beliefs of the ancients without replacing them by a new conception, and the logic of the situation has obliged the historians, after they had apparently rejected the divine authority of the kings and the fate of the ancients, to reach the same conclusion by another road, that is, to recognize, one, nations guided by individual men, and, two, the existence of a known aim to which these nations and humanity at large are tending. At the basis of the works of all the modern historians from Gibbon to Buckle, despite their seeming disagreements and the apparent novelty of their outlooks, lie those two old, unavoidable assumptions. In the first place the historian describes the activity of individuals who in his opinion have directed humanity, one historian considers only monarchs, generals, and ministers as being such men, while another includes also orators, learned men, reformers, philosophers, and poets. Secondly, it is assumed that the goal toward which humanity is being led is known to the historians, to one of them this goal is the greatness of the Roman, Spanish, or French realm, to another it is liberty, equality, and a certain kind of civilization of a small corner of the world called Europe. In 1789 a ferment arises in Paris, it grows, spreads, and is expressed by a movement of peoples from west to east. Several times it moves eastward and collides with a counter-movement from the east westward. In 1812 it reaches its extreme limit, Moscow, and then, with remarkable symmetry, a counter-movement occurs from east to west, attracting to it, as the first movement had done, the nations of Middle Europe. The counter-movement reaches the starting point of the first movement in the West, Paris, and subsides. During that twenty-year period an immense number of fields were left. Untilled, houses were burned, trade changed its direction, millions of men migrated, were impoverished, or were enriched, and millions of Christian men professing the law of love of their fellows slew one. Another. What does all this mean? Why did it happen? What made those people burn? Houses and slay their fellow men? What were the causes of these events? What force made men act so? These are the instinctive, plain, and most legitimate questions humanity asks itself when it encounters the monuments and tradition of that period. For a reply to these questions the common sense of mankind turns to the science of history, whose aim is to enable nations and humanity to know themselves. If history had retained the conception of the ancients it would have said that God, to reward or punish his people, gave Napoleon power and directed his will to the fulfillment of the divine ends, and that reply would have been clear and complete. One might believe or disbelieve. 
in the divine significance of Napoleon, but for anyone believing in it there would have been nothing unintelligible in the history of that period, nor would there have been any contradictions. But modern history cannot give that reply. Science does not admit the conception of the ancients as to the direct participation of the deity in human affairs, and therefore history ought to give other answers. Modern history replying to these questions says, you want to know what this movement means, what caused it, and what force produced these events? Then listen. Louis XIV was a very proud and self-confident man, he had such and such mistresses and such and such ministers and he ruled France badly. His descendants were weak men and they too ruled France badly. And they had such and such favorites and such and such mistresses. Moreover, certain men wrote some books at that time. At the end of the 18th century, there were a couple of dozen men in Paris who began to talk about all men being free and equal. This caused people all over France to begin to slash at and drown one another. They killed the king and many other people. At that time there was in France a man of genius, Napoleon. He conquered everybody everywhere, that is, he killed many people because he was a great genius. And for some reason he went to kill Africans, and killed them so well and was so cunning and wise that when he returned to France he ordered everybody to obey him, and they all obeyed him. Having become an emperor he again went out to kill people in Italy, Austria, and Prussia. And there too he killed a great many. In Russia there was an emperor, Alexander, who decided to restore order in Europe and therefore fought against Napoleon. In 1807 he suddenly made friends with him, but in 1811 they again quarreled and again began killing many people. Napoleon led 600,000 men into Russia and captured Moscow, then he suddenly ran away from Moscow, and the emperor. Alexander, helped by the advice of Stein and others, united Europe to arm against the disturber of its peace. All Napoleon's allies suddenly became his enemies and their forces advanced against the fresh forces he raised. The allies defeated Napoleon, entered Paris, forced Napoleon to abdicate, and sent him to the island of Elba, not depriving him of the title of emperor and showing him every respect, though five years before. And one year later they all regarded him as an outlaw and a brigand. Then Louis XVIII, who till then had been the laughingstock both of the French and the Allies, began to reign. And Napoleon, shedding tears before his old guards, renounced the throne and went into exile. Then, the skillful statesmen and diplomatists, especially Talleyrand, who managed to sit down in a particular chair before anyone else and thereby extended the frontiers of France, talked in Vienna and by these conversations made the nations happy or unhappy. Suddenly the diplomatists and monarchs nearly quarreled and were on the point of again ordering their armies to kill one another but just then Napoleon arrived in France with a battalion, and the French, who had been hating him, immediately all submitted to him. But the Allied monarchs were angry at this and went to fight the French once more. And they defeated the genius Napoleon and, suddenly recognizing him as a brigand, sent him to the island of St. Helena. And the exile, separated from the beloved, France so dear to his heart, died a lingering death on that rock and bequeathed his great deeds to posterity. But in Europe a reaction occurred and the sovereigns once again all began to oppress their subjects. It would be a mistake to think that this is ironic, a caricature of the historical accounts. On the contrary it is a very mild expression of 
the contradictory replies, not meeting the questions, which all the historians give, from the compilers of memoirs and the histories of separate states to the writers of general histories and the new histories of the culture of that period. The strangeness and absurdity of these replies arise from the fact that modern history, like a deaf man, answers questions no one has asked. If the purpose of history be to give a description of the movement of humanity and of the peoples, the first question, in the absence of a reply to which all the rest will be incomprehensible, is, what is the power that moves peoples? To this, modern history laboriously replies. Either that Napoleon was a great genius, or that Louis XIV was very proud, or that certain writers wrote certain books. All that may be so and mankind is ready to agree with it, but it is not. What was asked? All that would be interesting if we recognized a divine power based on itself and always consistently directing its nations. Through Napoleon's, Louis E.S., and writers, but we do not acknowledge such a power, and therefore before speaking about Napoleon's, Louis E.S., and authors, we ought to be shown the connection existing between these men and the movement of the nations. If instead of a divine power some other force has appeared, it should be explained in what this new force consists, for the whole interest of history lies precisely in that force. History seems to assume that this force is self-evident and known to everyone. But in spite of every desire to regard it as known, anyone reading many historical works cannot help doubting whether this new force, so variously understood by the historians themselves, is really quite well known to everybody. Chapter 355 What Force Moves the Nations? Biographical historians and historians of separate nations understand this force as a power inherent in heroes and rulers. In their narration, events occur solely by the will of a Napoleon, and Alexander, or in general of the persons they describe. The answers given by this kind of historian to the question of what force causes events to happen are satisfactory only as long as there is but one historian to each event. As soon as historians of different nationalities and tendencies begin to describe the same event, the replies they give immediately lose all meaning, for this force is understood by them all not only differently, but often in quite contradictory ways. One historian says that an event was produced by Napoleon's power, another that it was produced by Alexander's, a third that it was due to the power of some other person. Besides this, historians of that kind contradict each other even in their statement as to the force on which the authority of some particular person was based. Thiers, a Bonapartist, says that Napoleon's power was based on his virtue and genius. Lanfrey, a Republican, says it was based on his trickery and deception of the people. So the historians of this class, by mutually destroying one another's positions, destroy the understanding of the force which produces events, and furnish no reply to history's essential question. Writers of universal history who deal with all the nations seem to recognize how erroneous is the specialist historian's view of the force which produces events. They do not recognize it as a power inherent in heroes and rulers, but as the resultant of a multiplicity of variously directed forces. In describing a war or the subjugation of a people, a General historian looks for the cause of the event not in the power of one man, but in the interaction of many persons connected with the event. According to this view the power of historical personages, represented as the product of many forces, can no longer, it would seem, be regarded as a force that itself produces events. Yet in most cases universal. Historians still employ the conception of power as a force that itself 
produces events, and treat it as their cause. In their exposition, an historic character is first the product of his time, and his power only. The resultant of various forces, and then his power is itself a force. Producing events. Gervinus, Schlosser, and others, for instance, at one time prove Napoleon to be a product of the revolution, of the ideas of 1789 and so forth, and at another plainly say that the campaign of 1812 and other things they do not like were simply the product of Napoleon's misdirected will, and that the very ideas of 1789 were arrested in their development by Napoleon's caprice. The ideas of the revolution and the general temper of the age produced Napoleon's power. But Napoleon's power suppressed the ideas of the revolution and the general temper of the age. This curious contradiction is not accidental. Not only does it occur at every step, but the universal historian's accounts are all made up of a chain of such contradictions. This contradiction occurs because after entering the field of analysis the universal historians stop halfway to find component forces equal to the composite or resultant force, the sum of the components must equal the resultant. This condition is never observed by the universal historians, and so to explain the resultant forces they are obliged to admit, in addition to the insufficient components, another unexplained force affecting the resultant action. Specialist historians describing the campaign of 1813 or the restoration of the Bourbons plainly assert that these events were produced by the will of Alexander. But the universal historian Gervinus, refuting this opinion of the specialist historian, tries to prove that the campaign of 1813 and the restoration of the Bourbons were due to other things beside Alexander's will, such as the activity of Stein, Metternich, Madame de Stahl, Talleyrand, Fichte, Chateaubriand, and others. The historian evidently decomposes Alexander's power into the components, Talleyrand, Chateaubriand, and the rest, but the sum of the components, that is, the interactions of Chateaubriand, Talleyrand, Madame de Stahl, and the others, evidently does not equal the resultant, namely the phenomenon of millions of Frenchmen submitting to the Bourbons. That Chateaubriand, Madame de Stahl, and others spoke certain words to one another only, affected their mutual relations but does not account for the submission of millions and therefore to explain how from these relations of theirs the submission of millions of people resulted, that is, how component forces equal to one a gave a resultant equal to a thousand times a, the historian is again obliged to fall back on power, the force he had denied, and to recognize it as the resultant of the forces, that is, he has to admit an unexplained force acting on the resultant. And that is just what the universal historians do, and consequently they not only contradict the specialist historians but contradict themselves. Peasants having no clear idea of the cause of rain, say, according to whether they want rain or fine weather, the wind has blown the clouds away, or the wind has brought up the clouds. And in the same way the universal historians sometimes when it pleases them and fits in with their theory, say that power is the result of events, and sometimes when they want to prove something else, say that power produces events. A third class of historians, the so-called historians of culture, following the path laid down by the universal historians who sometimes accept writers and ladies as forces producing events, again take that force to be something quite different. They see it in what is called culture, in mental activity. The historians of culture are quite consistent in regard to their progenitors, the writers of universal histories, for if historical 
Events may be explained by the fact that certain persons treated one. Another in such and such ways, why not explain them by the fact that such and such people wrote such and such books. Of the immense number of indications accompanying every vital phenomenon, these historians select the indication of intellectual activity and say that this indication is the cause. But despite their endeavors to prove that the cause of events lies in intellectual activity, only by a great stretch can one admit that there is any connection between intellectual activity and the movement of peoples, and in no case can one admit that intellectual activity controls people's actions, for that view is not confirmed by such facts as the very cruel murders of the French Revolution resulting from the doctrine of the equality of man, or the very cruel wars and executions resulting from the preaching of love. But even admitting as correct all the cunningly devised arguments with which these histories are filled, admitting that nations are governed by some undefined force called an idea, history's essential question still remains unanswered, and to the former power of monarchs and to the influence of advisors and other people introduced by the universal historians, another, newer force, the idea, is added, the connection of which with the masses needs explanation. It is possible to understand that Napoleon had power and so events occurred, with some effort one may even conceive that Napoleon together with other influences was the cause of an event, but how a book, Le Contrat Social, had the effect of making Frenchmen begin to drown one another cannot be understood without an explanation of the causal nexus of this new force with the event. Undoubtedly some relation exists between all who live contemporaneously. And so it is possible to find some connection between the intellectual activity of men and their historical movements, just as such a connection may be found between the movements of humanity and commerce. Handicraft, gardening, or anything else you please. But why intellectual? Activity is considered by the historians of culture to be the cause or expression of the whole historical movement is hard to understand. Only the following considerations can have led the historians to such a conclusion, one, that history is written by learned men, and so it is natural and agreeable for them to think that the activity of their class supplies the basis of the movement of all humanity, just as a similar Belief is natural and agreeable to traders, agriculturists, and soldiers. If they do not express it, that is merely because traders and soldiers do not write history, and, too, that spiritual activity, enlightenment, civilization, culture, ideas, are all indistinct, indefinite conceptions, under whose banner it is very easy to use words having a still less definite meaning, and which can therefore be readily introduced into any theory. But not to speak of the intrinsic quality of histories of this kind, which may possibly even be of use to someone for something, the histories of culture, to which all general histories tend more and more to approximate, are significant from the fact that after seriously and minutely examining various religious, philosophic, and political doctrines as causes of events, as soon as they have to describe an actual historic event such as the campaign of 1812 for instance, they involuntarily describe it as resulting from an exercise of power, and say plainly that that was the result of Napoleon's will. Speaking so, the historians of culture involuntarily contradict themselves, and show that the new force they have devised does not account for what happens in history, and that history can only be explained by introducing a power which they apparently do not recognize. Chapter 356 A locomotive is moving. Someone asks, what moves it? A peasant says, the devil moves it. Another man says the locomotive moves because its wheels go round. 
A third asserts that the cause of its movement lies in the smoke which the wind carries away. The peasant is irrefutable. He has devised a complete explanation. 2. Refute him someone would have to prove to him that there is no devil. Or another peasant would have to explain to him that it is not the devil. But a German, who moves the locomotive. Only then, as a result of the contradiction, will they see that they are both wrong. But the man who says that the movement of the wheels is the cause refutes himself, for having once begun to analyze he ought to go on and explain further why. The wheels go round, until he has reached the ultimate cause of the movement of the locomotive in the pressure of steam in the boiler, he has no right to stop in his search for the cause. The man who explains the movement of the locomotive by the smoke that is carried back has Notice that the wheels do not supply an explanation and has taken the first sign that occurs to him and in his turn has offered that as an explanation. The only conception that can explain the movement of the locomotive is that of a force commensurate with the movement observed. The only conception that can explain the movement of the peoples is that of some force commensurate with the whole movement of the peoples. Yet to supply this conception various historians take forces of different kinds, all of which are incommensurate with the movement. Observed. Some see it as a force directly inherent in heroes, as the peasant sees the devil in the locomotive, others as a force resulting from several other forces, like the movement of the wheels, others again as an intellectual influence, like the smoke that is blown away. So long as histories are written of separate individuals, whether Caesars, Alexanders, Luthers, or Voltaires, and not the histories of all, absolutely all those who take part in an event, it is quite impossible to describe the movement of humanity without the conception of a force compelling men to direct their activity toward a certain end. And the only such conception known to historians is that of power. This conception is the one handle by means of which the material of history, as at present expounded, can be dealt with, and anyone who breaks that handle off, as Buckle did, without finding some other method of treating historical material, merely deprives himself of the one possible way of dealing with it. The necessity of the conception of Power as an explanation of historical events is best demonstrated by the universal historians and historians of culture themselves, for they professedly reject that conception but inevitably have recourse to it at every step. In dealing with humanity's inquiry, the science of history up to now is like money in circulation, paper money and coin. The biographies and Special national histories are like paper money. They can be used and can circulate and fulfill their purpose without harm to anyone and even advantageously, as long as no one asks what is the security behind them. You need only forget to ask how the will of heroes produces events, and such histories as Thiers will be interesting and instructive and may perhaps even possess a tinge of poetry. But just as doubts of the real value of paper money arise either because, being easy to make, too much of it gets made or because people try to exchange it for gold, so also doubts concerning the real value of such histories arise either because too many of them are written or because in his simplicity of heart. Someone inquires, by what force did Napoleon do this, that is, wants to exchange the current paper money for the real gold of actual comprehension. The writers of universal histories and of the history of culture are like people who, recognizing the defects of paper money, decide to substitute for it money made of metal that has not the specific gravity of gold. It may indeed make jingling coin, but will do no more than that. Paper money may deceive the ignorant, but nobody is deceived by 
tokens of base metal that have no value but merely jingle. As gold is. Gold only if it is serviceable not merely for exchange but also for use. So universal historians will be valuable only when they can reply to. History's essential question, what is power? The universal historians. Give contradictory replies to that question, while the historians of. Culture evade it and answer something quite different. And as counters. Of imitation gold can be used only among a group of people who agree to. Accept them as gold, or among those who do not know the nature of. Gold, so universal historians and historians of culture, not answering. Humanity's essential question, serve as currency for some purposes of. Their own, only in universities and among the mass of readers who have a. Taste for what they call, serious reading. Chapter 357. Having abandoned the conception of the ancients as to the divine. Subjection of the will of a nation to some chosen man and the subjection. Of that man's will to the deity, history cannot without contradictions. Take a single step till it has chosen one of two things, either a return. To the former belief in the direct intervention of the deity in human. Affairs or a definite explanation of the meaning of the force producing. Historical events and termed, power. A return to the first is impossible, the belief has been destroyed, and. So it is essential to explain what is meant by power. Napoleon ordered an army to be raised and go to war. We are so. Accustomed to that idea and have become so used to it that the question. Why did 600,000 men go to fight when Napoleon uttered? Certain words, seems to us senseless. He had the power and so what he. Ordered was done. This reply is quite satisfactory if we believe that the power was given. Him by God. But as soon as we do not admit that, it becomes essential to. Determine what is this power of one man over others. It cannot be the direct physical power of a strong man over a weak one, a domination based on the application or threat of physical force, like the power of Hercules, nor can it be based on the effect of moral force. As in their simplicity some historians think who say that the leading figures in history are heroes, that is, men gifted with a special strength of soul and mind called genius. This power cannot be based on the predominance of moral strength, for, not to mention heroes such as Napoleon about whose moral qualities opinions differ widely, history shows us that neither a Louis XI nor a Metternich, who ruled over millions of people, had any particular moral qualities, but on the contrary were generally morally weaker than any of the millions they ruled over. If the source of power lies neither in the physical nor in the moral qualities of him who possesses it, it must evidently be looked for elsewhere, in the relation to the people of the man who wields the power. And that is how power is understood by the science of jurisprudence. That exchange bank of history which offers to exchange histories. Understanding of power for true gold. Power is the collective will of the people transferred by expressed or tacit consent to their chosen rulers. In the domain of jurisprudence, which consists of discussions of how a state and power might be arranged were it possible for all that to be arranged, it is all very clear, but when applied to history that definition of power needs explanation. The science of jurisprudence regards the state and power as the ancients. Regarded fire, namely, as something existing absolutely. But for history, the state and power are merely phenomena, just as for modern physics. Fire is not an element but a phenomenon. From this fundamental difference between the view held by history and that held by jurisprudence, it follows that jurisprudence can tell minutely how in its opinion power should be constituted and what power existing immutably outside time, is, but to history's questions. About the meaning of the mutations of power in time it can answer. 
nothing. If power be the collective will of the people transferred to their ruler, was Pugachev a representative of the will of the people? If not, then why was Napoleon the first? Why was Napoleon the third a criminal when he was taken prisoner at Boulogne, and why, later on, were those criminals whom he arrested? Do palace revolutions, in which sometimes only two or three people take part, transfer the will of the people to a new ruler? In international relations, is the will of the people also transferred to their conqueror? Was the will of the Confederation of the Rhine transferred to Napoleon in 1806? Was the will of the Russian people transferred to Napoleon in 1809? when our army in alliance with the French went to fight the Austrians? To these questions three answers are possible. Either to assume, one, that the will of the people is always unconditionally transferred to the ruler or rulers they have chosen, and that therefore every emergence of a new power, every struggle against the power once appointed, should be absolutely regarded as an infringement of the real power, or, two, that the will of the people is transferred to the rulers conditionally, under definite and known conditions, and to show that all limitations, conflicts, and even destructions of power result from a non-observance by the rulers of the conditions under which their power was entrusted to them, or, three, that the will of the people is delegated to the rulers conditionally, but that the conditions are unknown and indefinite, and that the appearance of several authorities, their struggles and their falls, result solely from the greater or lesser fulfillment by the rulers of these unknown conditions on which the will of the people is transferred from some people to others. And these are the three ways in which the historians do explain the relation of the people to their rulers. Some historians, those biographical and specialist historians already referred to, in their simplicity failing to understand the question of the meaning of power, seem to consider that the collective will of the people is unconditionally transferred to historical persons, and therefore when describing some single state they assume that particular power to be the one absolute and real power, and that any other force Opposing this is not a power but a violation of power, mere violence. Their theory, suitable for primitive and peaceful periods of history, has the inconvenience, in application to complex and stormy periods in the life of nations during which various powers arise simultaneously and struggle with one another, that a legitimist historian will prove that the National Convention, the Directory, and Bonaparte were mere infringers of the true power, while a republican and a bonapartist will prove, the one that the convention and the other that the empire was the real power, and that all the others were violations of power. Evidently the explanations furnished by these historians being mutually contradictory can only satisfy young children. Recognizing the falsity of this view of history, another set of Historians say that power rests on a conditional delegation of the will of the people to their rulers, and that historical leaders have power only conditionally on carrying out the program that the will of the people has by tacit agreement prescribed to them. But what this program consists in these historians do not say, or if they do they continually contradict one another. Each historian, according to his view of what constitutes a nation's progress, looks for these conditions in the greatness, wealth, freedom, or enlightenment of citizens of France or some other country. But not to mention the historian's contradictions as to the nature of this program, or even admitting that some one general program of these conditions exists, the facts of history almost always contradict that. Theory. If the conditions under which power is entrusted consist in the wealth, freedom, and enlightenment of the people, how is it that Lewis 
14 and Yvonne the Terrible end their reigns tranquilly, while Louis XVI and Charles I are executed by their people? To this question historians reply that Louis XIV's activity, contrary to the program, reacted on Louis XVI. But why did it not react on Louis XIV or on Louis XV, why? Should it react just on Louis XVI? And what is the time limit for such reactions? To these questions there are and can be no answers. Equally, little does this view explain why for several centuries the collective will is not withdrawn from certain rulers and their heirs, and then suddenly during a period of fifty years is transferred to the convention, to the directory, to Napoleon, to Alexander, to Louis XVIII. To Napoleon again, to Charles X, to Louis Philippe, to a Republican government, and to Napoleon III. When explaining these rapid transfers of the people's will from one individual to another, especially in view of international relations, conquests, and alliances, the historians are obliged to admit that some of these transfers are not normal delegations of the people's will but are accidents dependent on cunning, on mistakes, on craft, or on the weakness of a diplomatist, a ruler, or a party leader. So that the greater part of the events of history, civil wars, revolutions, and conquests, are presented by these historians. Not as the results of free transferences of the people's will, but as Results of the ill-directed will of one or more individuals, that is. Once again, as usurpations of power. And so these historians also see. And admit historical events which are exceptions to the theory. These historians resemble a botanist who, having noticed that some. Plants grow from seeds producing two cotyledons, should insist that all. That grows does so by sprouting into two leaves, and that the palm, the mushroom, and even the oak, which blossom into full growth and no longer resemble two leaves, are deviations from the theory. Historians of the third class assume that the will of the people is transferred to historic personages conditionally, but that the conditions are unknown to us. They say that historical personages have power only because they fulfill the will of the people which has been delegated to them. But in that case, if the force that moves nations lies not in the historic leaders but in the nations themselves, what significance have those leaders? The leaders, these historians tell us, express the will of the people. The activity of the leaders represents the activity of the people. But in that case the question arises whether all the activity of the leader serves as an expression of the people's will or only some part of it. If the whole activity of the leader serves as the expression of the people's will, as some historians suppose, then all the details of the court scandals contained in the biographies of a Napoleon or a Catherine serve to express the life of the nation, which is evident. Nonsense, but if it is only some particular side of the activity of an historical leader which serves to express the people's life, as other so-called philosophical historians believe, then to determine which side of the activity of a leader expresses the nation's life, we have first of all to know in what the nation's life consists. Met by this difficulty historians of that class devise some most obscure, impalpable, and general abstraction which can cover all conceivable occurrences, and declare this abstraction to be the aim of humanity's movement. The most usual generalizations adopted by almost all the historians are, freedom, equality, enlightenment, progress, civilization, and culture. Postulating some generalization as the goal of the movement of humanity, the historians study the men of whom the greatest number of monuments have remained, kings, ministers, generals, authors, reformers, popes, and journalists, 
to the extent to which in their opinion these persons have promoted or hindered that abstraction. But as it is in no way proved that the aim of humanity does consist in freedom, equality, enlightenment, or civilization, and as the connection of the people with the rulers and enlighteners of humanity is only based on the arbitrary assumption that the collective will of the people is always transferred to the men whom we have noticed, it happens that the activity of the millions who migrate, burn houses, abandon agriculture, and destroy one another never is expressed in the account of the activity of some dozen people who did not burn houses, practice agriculture, or slay their fellow creatures. History proves this at every turn. Is the ferment of the peoples of the West at the end of the 18th century and their drive eastward. Explained by the activity of Louis XIV, 15, and 16, their mistresses and ministers, and by the lives of Napoleon, Rousseau, Diderot, Beaumarchais, and others? Is the movement of the Russian people eastward to Kazan and Siberia? Expressed by details of the morbid character of Ivan the Terrible and by his correspondence with Kurbsky? Is the movement of the peoples at the time of the Crusades explained by the life and activity of the Godfreys and the Louis E.S. and their ladies? For us, that movement of the peoples from west to east, without leaders, with a crowd of vagrants, and with Peter the Hermit, remains incomprehensible. And yet more incomprehensible is the cessation of that movement when a rational and sacred aim for the crusade, the deliverance of Jerusalem, had been clearly defined by historic leaders. Popes, kings, and knights incited the peoples to free the Holy Land, but the people did not go, for the unknown cause which had previously impelled them to go no longer existed. The history of the Godfreys and the Minzingers can evidently not cover the life of the peoples. And the history of the Godfreys and the Minzingers has remained the history of Godfreys and Minzingers, but the history of the life of the peoples and their impulses has remained unknown. Still less does the history of authors and reformers explain to us the life of the peoples. The history of culture explains to us the impulses and conditions of life and thought of a writer or a reformer. We learn that Luther had a hot temper and said such and such things, we learn that Rousseau was suspicious and wrote such and such books, but we do not learn why after the Reformation the peoples massacred one another, nor why during the French Revolution they guillotined one another. If we unite both these kinds of history, as is done by the newest historians, we shall have the history of monarchs and writers, but not the history of the life of the peoples. Chapter 358 The life of the nations is not contained in the lives of a few men, for the connection between those men and the nations has not been found. The theory that this connection is based on the transference of the collective will of a people to certain historical personages is an hypothesis unconfirmed by the experience of history. The theory of the transference of the collective will of the people to historic persons may perhaps explain much in the domain of jurisprudence and be essential for its purposes, but in its application to history, as soon as revolutions, conquests, or civil wars occur, that is, as soon as history begins, that theory explains nothing. The theory seems irrefutable just because the act of transference of the people's will cannot be verified, for it never occurred. Whatever happens and whoever may stand at the head of affairs, the Theory can always say that such and such a person took the lead because the collective will was transferred to him. The replies this theory gives to historical questions are like the replies of a man who, watching the movements of a herd of cattle and paying no attention to the varying quality of the pasturage in different parts of the field, or to the driving of the herdsmen, should attribute 
the direction the herd takes to what animal happens to be at its head. The herd goes in that direction because the animal in front leads. It and the collective will of all the other animals is vested in that. Leader. This is what historians of the first class say, those who assume. The unconditional transference of the people's will. If the animals leading the herd change, this happens because the collective will of all the animals is transferred from one leader to another, according to whether the animal is or is not leading them in the direction selected by the whole herd. Such is the reply historians who assume that the collective will of the people is delegated to rulers under conditions which they regard as known. With this method of observation it often happens that the observer, influenced by the direction he himself prefers, regards those as leaders who, owing to the people's change of direction, are no longer in front, but on one side, or even in the rear. If the animals in front are continually changing and the direction of the whole herd is constantly altered, this is because in order to follow a given direction the animals transfer their will to the animals that have attracted our attention, and to study the movements of the herd. We must watch the movements of all the prominent animals moving on all sides of the herd. So say the third class of historians who regard all historical persons, from monarchs to journalists, as the expression of their age. The theory of the transference of the will of the people to historic persons is merely a paraphrase, a restatement of the question in other words. What causes historical events? Power. What is power? Power is the collective will of the people transferred to one person. Under what condition is the will of the people delegated to one person? On condition that that person expresses the will of the whole people. That is, power is power, in other words, power is a word the meaning of which we do not understand. If the realm of human knowledge were confined to abstract reasoning, then having subjected to criticism the explanation of power that juridical science gives us, humanity would conclude that power is merely a word and has no real existence. But to understand phenomena man has, besides abstract reasoning, experience by which he verifies his reflections. And experience tells us that power is not merely a word but an actually existing phenomenon. Not to speak of the fact that no description of the collective activity of men can do without the conception of power, the existence of power is proved both by history and by observing contemporary events. Whenever an event occurs a man appears or men appear, by whose will the event seems to have taken place. Napoleon III issues a decree and the French go to Mexico. The King of Prussia and Bismarck issue decrees and an army enters Bohemia. Napoleon I issues a decree and an army enters Russia. Alexander I gives a command and the French submit to the Bourbons. Experience shows us that whatever event occurs it is always related to the will of one or of several men who have decreed it. The historians, in accord with the old habit of acknowledging divine intervention in human affairs, want to see the cause of events in the expression of the will of someone endowed with power, but that Supposition is not confirmed either by reason or by experience. On the one side reflection shows that the expression of a man's will, his words, are only part of the general activity expressed in an event. As for instance in a war or a revolution, and so without assuming an incomprehensible, supernatural force, a miracle, one cannot admit that. Words can be the immediate cause of the movements of millions of men. On the other hand, even if we admitted that words could be the cause of events, history shows that the expression of the will of historical personages does not in most cases produce any effect, that is to say, 
Their commands are often not executed, and sometimes the very opposite. Of what they order occurs. Without admitting divine intervention in the affairs of humanity we cannot regard power as the cause of events. Power, from the standpoint of experience, is merely the relation that exists between the expression of someone's will and the execution of that will by others. To explain the conditions of that relationship we must first establish a conception of the expression of will, referring it to man and not to the deity. If the deity issues a command, expresses his will, as ancient history tells us, the expression of that will is independent of time and is not caused by anything, for the divinity is not controlled by an event. But, speaking of commands that are the expression of the will of men acting in time and in relation to one another, to explain the connection of commands with events we must restore, one, the condition of all that takes place, the continuity of movement in time both of the events and of the person who commands, and, two, the inevitability of the connection between the person commanding and those who execute his command. Chapter 359 Only the expression of the will of the deity, not dependent on time, can relate to a whole series of events occurring over a period of years or centuries, and only the deity, independent of everything, can by his soul will determine the direction of humanity's movement, but man acts in time and himself takes part in what occurs. Reinstating the first condition omitted, that of time, we see that no command can be executed without some preceding order having been given, rendering the execution of the last command possible. No command ever appears spontaneously, or itself covers a whole series of occurrences, but each command follows from another, and never refers to a whole series of events but always to one moment only of an event. When, for instance, we say that Napoleon ordered armies to go to war, we combine in one simultaneous expression a whole series of consecutive commands dependent one on another. Napoleon could not have commanded an invasion of Russia and never did so. Today he ordered such and such papers to be written to Vienna, to Berlin, and to Petersburg. Tomorrow such and such decrees and orders to the army, the fleet, the commissariat, and so on and so on, millions of commands, which formed a whole series corresponding to a series of events which brought the French armies into Russia. If throughout his reign Napoleon gave commands concerning an invasion of England and expended on no other undertaking so much time and effort, and yet during his whole reign never once attempted to execute that design but undertook an expedition into Russia, with which country he considered it desirable to be in alliance, a conviction he repeatedly expressed, this came about because his commands did not correspond to the course of events in the first case, but did so correspond in the latter. For an order to be certainly executed, it is necessary that a man should order what can be executed. But to know what can and what cannot be executed is impossible, not only in the case of Napoleon's invasion of Russia in which millions participated, but even in the simplest event. For in either case millions of obstacles may arise to prevent its execution. Every order executed is always one of an immense number. Unexecuted. All the impossible orders inconsistent with the course of events remain unexecuted. Only the possible ones get linked up with a consecutive series of commands corresponding to a series of events, and are executed. Our false conception that an event is caused by a command which precedes it is due to the fact that when the event has taken place and out of thousands of others those few commands which were consistent with that event have been executed, we forget about the others that were not executed because they could not be. Apart from that, the chief source 
of our error in this matter is due to the fact that in the historical accounts a whole series of innumerable, diverse, and petty events, such, for instance as all those which led the French armies to Russia, is generalized into one event in accord with the result produced by that series of events, and corresponding with this generalization the whole series of commands is also generalized into a single expression of will. We say that Napoleon wished to invade Russia and invaded it. In reality in all Napoleon's activity we never find anything resembling an expression of that wish, but find a series of orders, or expressions of his will, very variously and indefinitely directed. Amid a long series of unexecuted orders of Napoleon's one series, for the campaign of 1812, was carried out, not because those orders differed in any way from the other, unexecuted orders but because they coincided with the course of events that led the French army into Russia, just as in stencil work. This or that figure comes out not because the color was laid on from this side or in that way, but because it was laid on from all sides over the figure cut in the stencil. So that examining the relation in time of the commands to the events, we find that a command can never be the cause of the event, but that a certain definite dependence exists between the two. To understand in what this dependence consists it is necessary to reinstate another omitted condition of every command proceeding not from the deity but from a man, which is, that the man who gives the command himself takes part in the event. This relation of the commander to those he commands is just what is called power. This relation consists in the following. For common action people always unite in certain combinations, in which, regardless of the difference of the aim set for the common action, the Relation between those taking part in it is always the same. Men uniting in these combinations always assume such relations toward one another that the larger number take a more direct share, and the smaller number a less direct share, in the collective action for which they have combined. Of all the combinations in which men unite for collective action one of the most striking and definite examples is an army. Every army is composed of lower grades of the service, the rank and file, of whom there are always the greatest number, of the next higher military rank, corporals and non-commissioned officers of whom there are fewer, and of still higher officers of whom there are still fewer, and so on to the highest military command which is concentrated in one person. A military organization may be quite correctly compared to a cone, of which the base with the largest diameter consists of the rank and file. The next higher and smaller section of the cone consists of the next higher grades of the army, and so on to the apex, the point of which will represent the commander-in-chief. The soldiers, of whom there are the most, form the lower section of the cone and its base. The soldier himself does the stabbing, hacking, burning, and pillaging, and always receives orders for these actions. From men above him, he himself never gives an order. The non-commissioned officers, of whom there are fewer, perform the action itself less frequently than the soldiers, but they already give commands. An officer still less often acts directly himself but commands still more. Frequently. A general does nothing but command the troops, indicates the objective, and hardly ever uses a weapon himself. The commander-in-chief never takes direct part in the action itself, but only gives general orders concerning the movement of the mass of the troops. A similar relation of people to one another is seen in every combination of men. For common activity, in agriculture, trade, and every administration. And so without particularly analyzing all the contiguous sections of a cone and of the ranks of an army, or the ranks and positions in 
any administrative or public business whatever from the lowest to the highest, we see a law by which men, to take associated action, combine in such relations that the more directly they participate in performing the action the less they can command and the more numerous they are. While the less their direct participation in the action itself, the more they command and the fewer of them there are, rising in this way from the lowest ranks to the man at the top, who takes the least direct share in the action and directs his activity chiefly to commanding. This relation of the men who command to those they command is what constitutes the essence of the conception called power. Having restored the condition of time under which all events occur, we find that a command is executed only when it is related to a corresponding series of events. Restoring the essential condition of relation between those who command and those who execute, we find that by the very nature of the case those who command take the smallest part in the action itself and that their activity is exclusively directed to commanding. Chapter 360 When an event is taking place people express their opinions and wishes about it, and as the event results from the collective activity of many people, some one of the opinions or wishes expressed is sure to be fulfilled if but approximately. When one of the opinions expressed is fulfilled, that opinion gets connected with the event as a command. Preceding it. Men are hauling a log. Each of them expresses his opinion as to how and where to haul it. They haul the log away, and it happens that this is done as one of them said. He ordered it. There we have command and power. In their primary form. The man who worked most with his hands could not think so much about what he was doing or reflect on or command what would result from the common activity, while the man who commanded more would evidently work less with his hands on account of his greater verbal activity. When some larger concourse of men direct their activity to a common aim, there is a yet sharper division of those who, because their activity is given to directing and commanding, take less part in the direct work. When a man works alone he always has a certain set of reflections which, as it seems to him directed his past activity, justify his present activity, and guide him in planning his future actions. Just the same is done by a concourse of people, allowing those who do not take a direct part in the activity to devise considerations, justifications, and surmises concerning their collective activity. For reasons known or unknown to us the French began to drown and kill one another. And corresponding to the event its justification appears in people's belief that this was necessary for the welfare of France, for liberty, and for equality. People ceased to kill one another, and this event was accompanied by its justification in the necessity for a centralization of power, resistance to Europe, and so on. Men went from the west to the east killing their fellow men, and the event was accompanied by phrases about the glory of France, the baseness of England, and so on. History shows us that these justifications of the Events have no common sense and are all contradictory, as in the case of killing a man as the result of recognizing his rights, and the killing of millions in Russia for the humiliation of England. But these justifications have a very necessary significance in their own day. These justifications release those who produce the events from moral responsibility. These temporary aims are like the broom fixed in front of a locomotive to clear the snow from the rails in front, they clear men's moral responsibilities from their path. Without such justification there would be no reply to the simplest question that presents itself when examining each historical event. How is it that millions of men commit collective crimes, make war, commit murder, and so on? 
with the present complex forms of political and social life in Europe. Can any event that is not prescribed, decreed, or ordered by monarchs, ministers, parliaments, or newspapers be imagined? Is there any collective action which cannot find its justification in political unity, in patriotism, in the balance of power, or in civilization? So, that every event that occurs inevitably coincides with some expressed wish and, receiving a justification, presents itself as the result of the will of one man or of several men. In whatever direction a ship moves, the flow of the waves it cuts will always be noticeable ahead of it. To those on board the ship the movement of those waves will be the only perceptible motion. Only by watching closely moment by moment the movement of that flow and comparing it with the movement of the ship do we convince ourselves that every bit of it is occasioned by the forward movement of the ship and that we were led into error by the fact that we ourselves were imperceptibly moving. We see the same if we watch moment by moment the movement of historical characters, that is, re-establish the inevitable condition of all that occurs, the continuity of movement in time, and do not lose sight of the essential connection of historical persons with the masses. When the ship moves in one direction there is one and the same wave. Ahead of it, when it turns frequently the wave ahead of it also turns. Frequently. But wherever it may turn there always will be the wave. Anticipating its movement. Whatever happens it always appears that just that event was foreseen and decreed. Wherever the ship may go, the rush of water which neither directs nor increases its movement foams ahead of it, and at a distance, seems to us not merely to move of itself but to govern the ship's movement also. Examining only those expressions of the will of historical persons, which, as commands, were related to events, historians have assumed that the events depended on those commands. But examining the events themselves and the connection in which the historical persons stood to the people, we have found that they and their orders were dependent on events. The incontestable proof of this deduction is that, however many commands were issued, the event does not take place unless there are other causes for it but as soon as an event occurs, be it what it may, then out of all the continually expressed wishes of different people, some will always be found which by their meaning and their time of utterance are related as commands to the events. Arriving at this conclusion we can reply directly and positively to these two essential questions of history. 1. What is power? 2. What force produces the movement of the nations? 1. Power is the relation of a given person to other individuals. In which the more this person expresses opinions, predictions, and justifications of the collective action that is performed, the less is his participation in that action. 2. The movement of nations is caused not by power, nor by intellectual activity, nor even by a combination of the two as historians have supposed, but by the activity of all the people who participate in the events, and who always combine in such a way that those taking the largest direct share in the event take on themselves the least responsibility and vice versa. Morally the wielder of power appears to cause the event, physically. It is those who submit to the power. But as the moral activity is inconceivable without the physical, the cause of the event is neither in the one nor in the other but in the union of the two. Or in other words, the conception of a cause is inapplicable to the phenomena we are examining. In the last analysis we reach the circle of infinity, that final limit, to which in every domain of thought man's reason arrives if it is not playing with the subject. Electricity produces heat, heat produces Electricity. Atoms attract each other and atoms repel one another. 
Speaking of the interaction of heat and electricity and of atoms, we cannot say why this occurs, and we say that it is so because it is inconceivable otherwise, because it must be so and that it is a law. The same applies to historical events. Why war and revolution occur we do not know. We only know that to produce the one or the other action. People combine in a certain formation in which they all take part, and we say that this is so because it is unthinkable otherwise, or in other words that it is a law. Chapter 361 If history dealt only with external phenomena, the establishment of this simple and obvious law would suffice and we should have finished our argument. But the law of history relates to man. A particle of matter cannot tell us that it does not feel the law of attraction or repulsion. And that that law is untrue, but man, who is the subject of history, says plainly, I am free and am therefore not subject to the law. The presence of the problem of man's free will, though unexpressed, is felt at every step of history. All seriously thinking historians have involuntarily encountered this. Question. All the contradictions and obscurities of history and the false path historical science has followed are due solely to the lack of a solution of that question. If the will of every man were free, that is, if each man could act as he pleased, all history would be a series of disconnected incidents. If in a thousand years even one man in a million could act freely, that is, as he chose, it is evident that one single free act of that man's in violation of the laws governing human action would destroy the possibility of the existence of any laws for the whole of humanity. If there be a single law governing the actions of men, free will cannot exist, for then man's will is subject to that law. In this contradiction lies the problem of free will, which from most ancient times has occupied the best human minds and from most ancient times has been presented in its whole tremendous significance. The problem is that regarding man as a subject of observation, from whatever point of view, theological, historical, ethical, or philosophic, we find a general law of necessity to which he, like all, that exists, is subject. But regarding him from within ourselves as what we are conscious of, we feel ourselves to be free. This consciousness is a source of self-cognition quite apart from and independent of reason. Through his reason man observes himself, but only through consciousness does he know himself. Apart from consciousness of self no observation or application of reason is conceivable. To understand, observe, and draw conclusions, man must first of all be conscious of himself as living. A man is only conscious of himself as a living being by the fact that he wills, that is, is conscious of his volition. But his will, which forms the essence of his life, man recognizes, and can but recognize, as free. If, observing himself, man sees that his will is always directed by one and the same law, whether he observes the necessity of taking food, using his brain, or anything else, he cannot recognize this never varying direction of his will otherwise than as a limitation of it. Were it not free it could not be limited. A man's will seems to him to be limited just because he is not conscious of it except as free. You say, I am not free. But I have lifted my hand and let it fall. Everyone understands that this illogical reply is an irrefutable demonstration of freedom. That reply is the expression of a consciousness that is not subject to reason. If the consciousness of freedom were not a separate and independent source of self-consciousness it would be subject to reasoning and to experience, but in fact such subjection does not exist and is inconceivable. 
A series of experiments and arguments proves to every man that he, as an object of observation, is subject to certain laws, and man submits to them and never resists the laws of gravity or impermeability once he has become acquainted with them. But the same series of experiments and arguments proves to him that the complete freedom of which he is conscious in himself is impossible, and that his every action depends on his organization, his character, and the motives acting upon him, yet man never submits to the deductions of these experiments and arguments. Having learned from experiment and argument that a stone falls downwards, a man indubitably believes this and always expects the law that he has learned to be fulfilled. But learning just as certainly that his will is subject to laws, he does not and cannot believe this. However often experiment and reasoning may show a man that under the same conditions and with the same character he will do the same thing as before, yet when under the same conditions and with the same character, he approaches for the thousandth time the action that always ends in the same way, he feels as certainly convinced as before the experiment, that he can act as he pleases. Every man, savage or sage, however, incontestably reason and experiment may prove to him that it is impossible to imagine two different courses of action in precisely the same conditions, feels that without this irrational conception, which constitutes the essence of freedom, he cannot imagine life. He feels that however impossible it may be, it is so, for without this conception of freedom not only would he be unable to understand life, but he would be unable to live for a single moment. He could not live, because all man's efforts, all his impulses to life, are only efforts to increase freedom, wealth and poverty, fame and obscurity, power and subordination, strength and weakness, health and disease, culture and ignorance, work and leisure, repletion and hunger. Virtue and vice, are only greater or lesser degrees of freedom. A man having no freedom cannot be conceived of except as deprived of life. If the conception of freedom appears to reason to be a senseless contradiction like the possibility of performing two actions at one end, the same instant of time, or of an effect without a cause, that only proves that consciousness is not subject to reason. This unshakable, irrefutable consciousness of freedom, uncontrolled by Experiment or argument, recognized by all thinkers and felt by everyone. Without exception, this consciousness without which no conception of man is possible constitutes the other side of the question. Man is the creation of an all-powerful, all-good, and all-seeing God. What is sin, the conception of which arises from the consciousness of man's freedom? That is a question for theology. The actions of men are subject to general immutable laws expressed in statistics. What is man's responsibility to society, the conception of which results from the conception of freedom? That is a question for jurisprudence. Man's actions proceed from his innate character and the motives acting upon him. What is conscience and the perception of right and wrong? In actions that follows from the consciousness of freedom? That is a question for ethics. Man in connection with the general life of humanity appears subject to laws which determine that life. But the same man apart from that connection appears to be free. How should the past life of nations and of humanity be regarded, as the result of the free, or as the result of the constrained, activity of man? That is a question for history. Only in our self-confident day of the popularization of knowledge, thanks to that most powerful engine of ignorance, the diffusion of printed matter, has the question of the freedom of will been put on a level on which the question itself cannot exist. In our time the majority of 
so-called advanced people, that is, the crowd of ignoramuses, have taken. The work of the naturalists who deal with one side of the question for a solution of the whole problem. They say and write and print that the soul and freedom do not exist. For the life of man is expressed by muscular movements and muscular. Movements are conditioned by the activity of the nerves, the soul and free will do not exist because at an unknown period of time we sprang from the apes. They say this, not at all suspecting that thousands of years ago that same law of necessity which with such ardor they are now trying to prove by physiology and comparative zoology was not merely acknowledged by all the religions and all the thinkers, but has never been denied. They do not see that the role of the natural sciences in this matter is merely to serve as an instrument for the illumination of one side of it. For the fact that, from the point of view of observation, reason and the will are merely secretions of the brain, and that man following the general law may have developed from lower animals at some unknown period of time, only explains from a fresh side. The truth admitted thousands of years ago by all the religious and philosophic theories, that from the point of view of reason man is subject to the law of necessity, but it does not advance by a hair's breadth the solution of the question, which has another, opposite, side, based on the consciousness of freedom. If men descended from the apes at an unknown period of time, that is as comprehensible as that they were made from a handful of earth at a certain period of time, in the first case the unknown quantity is the time, in the second case it is the origin, and the question of how man's consciousness of freedom is to be reconciled with the law of necessity to which he is subject cannot be solved by comparative physiology and zoology, for in a frog, a rabbit, or an ape, we can observe only the muscular nervous activity, but in man we observe consciousness as well as the muscular and nervous activity. The naturalists and their followers, thinking they can solve this question, are like plasterers set to plaster one side of the walls of a church who, availing themselves of the absence of the chief superintendent of the work, should in an access of zeal plaster over the windows, icons, woodwork, and still unbuttressed walls, and should be delighted that from their point of view as plasterers, everything is now so smooth and regular. Chapter 362 For the solution of the question of free will or inevitability, history has this advantage over other branches of knowledge in which the question is dealt with, that for history this question does not refer to the essence of man's free will but its manifestation in the past and under certain conditions. In regard to this question, history stands to the other sciences as experimental science stands to abstract science. The subject for history is not man's will itself but our presentation of it. And so for history, the insoluble mystery presented by the incompatibility of free will and inevitability does not exist as it does for theology, ethics, and philosophy. History surveys a presentation of man's life in which the union of these two contradictions has already taken place. In actual life each historic event, each human action, is very clearly and definitely understood without any sense of contradiction, although each event presents itself as partly free and partly compulsory. To solve the question of how freedom and necessity are combined and what constitutes the essence of these two conceptions, the philosophy of history can and should follow a path contrary to that taken by other sciences. Instead of first defining the conceptions of freedom and inevitability in themselves, and then ranging the phenomena of life. Under those definitions, history should deduce a definition of the conception of freedom and inevitability themselves from the immense quantity of phenomena of which it is cognizant and that always appear 
dependent on these two elements. Whatever presentation of the activity of many men or of an individual. We may consider, we always regard it as the result partly of man's free will and partly of the law of inevitability. Whether we speak of the migration of the peoples and the incursions of the barbarians, or of the decrees of Napoleon III, or of someone's action an hour ago in choosing one direction out of several for his walk, we are unconscious of any contradiction. The degree of freedom and inevitability governing the actions of these people is clearly defined. For us, our conception of the degree of freedom often varies according to differences in the point of view from which we regard the event, but every human action appears to us as a certain combination of freedom and inevitability. In every action we examine we see a certain measure of freedom and a certain measure of inevitability. And always the more freedom we see in any action the less inevitability do we perceive, and the more inevitability the less freedom. The proportion of freedom to inevitability decreases and increases according to the point of view from which the action is regarded, but their relation is always one of inverse proportion. A sinking man who clutches at another and drowns him, or a hungry mother. Exhausted by feeding her baby, who steals some food, or a man trained to discipline who on duty at the word of command kills a defenseless man, seem less guilty, that is, less free and more subject to the law of necessity, to one who knows the circumstances in which these people were placed, and more free to one who does not know that the man was himself drowning, that the mother was hungry, that the soldier was in the ranks, and so on. Similarly a man who committed a murder twenty years ago and has since lived peaceably and harmlessly in society seems less guilty, and his action more due to the law of inevitability, to someone who considers his action after twenty years have elapsed than to one who examined it the day after it was committed. And in the same way every Action of an insane, intoxicated, or highly excited man appears less free and more inevitable to one who knows the mental condition of him who committed the action and seems more free and less inevitable to one who does not know it. In all these cases the conception of freedom is increased or diminished and the conception of compulsion is correspondingly decreased or increased according to the point of view from which the action is regarded. So that the greater the conception of necessity the smaller the conception of freedom and vice versa. Religion, the common sense of mankind, the science of jurisprudence, and history itself understand alike this relation between necessity and freedom. All cases without exception in which our conception of freedom and Necessity is increased and diminished depend on three considerations. 1. The relation to the external world of the man who commits the deeds. 2. His relation to time. 3. His relation to the causes leading to the action. The first consideration is the clearness of our perception of the man's relation to the external world and the greater or lesser clearness of our understanding of the definite position occupied by the man in relation to everything coexisting with him. This is what makes it evident that a drowning man is less free and more subject to necessity than one standing on dry ground, and that makes the actions of a man closely connected with others in a thickly populated district, or of one bound by family, official, or business duties, seem certainly less free and more subject to necessity than those of a man living in solitude and seclusion. If we consider a man alone, apart from his relation to everything around him, each action of his seems to us free. But if we see his relation to anything around him, if we see his connection with anything, whatever, with a man who speaks to him, a book he reads, the work on which he is engaged, even with the air he breathes or the light that 
falls on the things about him, we see that each of these circumstances has an influence on him and controls at least some side of his activity. And the more we perceive of these influences the more our conception of his freedom diminishes and the more our conception of the necessity that weighs on him increases. The second consideration is the more or less evident time relation of the man to the world and the clearness of our perception of the place. The man's action occupies in time. That is the ground which makes the fall of the first man, resulting in the production of the human race, appear evidently less free than a man's entry into marriage today. It is the reason why the life and activity of people who lived centuries ago and are connected with me in time cannot seem to me as free as the life of a contemporary, the consequences of which are still unknown to me. The degree of our conception of freedom or inevitability depends in this respect on the greater or lesser lapse of time between the performance of the action and our judgment of it. If I examine an act I performed a moment ago in approximately the same circumstances as those I am in now, my action appears to me undoubtedly free. But if I examine an act performed a month ago, then being in different circumstances, I cannot help recognizing that if that act had not been committed much that resulted from it, good, agreeable, and even essential, would not have taken place. If I reflect on an action still more remote, ten years ago or more, then the consequences of my action are still plainer to me and I find it hard to imagine what would have happened had that action not been performed. The farther I go back in memory, or what is the same thing the farther I go forward in my judgment, the more doubtful becomes my belief in the freedom of my action. In history we find a very similar progress of conviction concerning the part played by free will in the general affairs of humanity. A contemporary event seems to us to be indubitably the doing of all the known participants, but with a more remote event we already see its inevitable results which prevent our considering anything else possible. And the farther we go back in examining events the less arbitrary do they appear. The Austro-Prussian War appears to us undoubtedly the result of the crafty conduct of Bismarck, and so on. The Napoleonic Wars still seem to us, though already questionably, to be the outcome of their heroes. Will. But in the Crusades we already see an event occupying its definite place in history and without which we cannot imagine the modern history of Europe, though to the chroniclers of the Crusades that event appeared as merely due to the will of certain people. In regard to the migration of the peoples it does not enter anyone's head today to suppose that the renovation of the European world depended on Attila's caprice. The farther back in history the object of our observation lies, the more doubtful does the free will of those concerned in the event become and the more manifest the law of inevitability. The third consideration is the degree to which we apprehend that endless chain of causation inevitably demanded by reason, in which each phenomenon comprehended, and therefore man's every action, must have its definite place as a result of what has gone before and as a cause of what will follow. The better we are acquainted with the physiological, psychological, and historical laws deduced by observation and by which man is controlled. And the more correctly we perceive the physiological, psychological, and historical causes of the action, and the simpler the action we are. Observing and the less complex the character and mind of the man in question, the more subject to inevitability and the less free do our actions and those of others appear. When we do not at all understand the cause of an action, whether a crime, a good action, or even one that is simply non-moral, we ascribe a greater amount of freedom to it. In the case of a crime we most urgently demand the punishment for such an act, 
in the case of a virtuous act we rate its merit most highly. In an indifferent case we recognize in it more individuality, originality, and independence. But if even one of the innumerable causes of the act is known to us we recognize a certain element of necessity and are less insistent on punishment for the crime or the acknowledgement of the merit of the virtuous act or the freedom of the apparently original action that a criminal was reared among malefactors mitigates his fault in our eyes the self-sacrifice of a father or mother or self-sacrifice with the possibility of a reward is more comprehensible than gratuitous self-sacrifice and therefore seems less deserving of sympathy and less the result of free will the founder of a sect or party or an inventor impresses us less when we know how or by what the way was prepared for his activity if we have a large range of examples if our observation is constantly directed to seeking the correlation of cause and effect in people's actions, their actions appear to us more under compulsion and less free the more correctly we connect the effects with the causes. If we examined simple actions and had a vast number of such actions under observation, our conception of their inevitability would be still greater. The dishonest conduct of the son of a dishonest father, the misconduct of a woman who had fallen into bad company, a drunkard's relapse into drunkenness, and so on are actions that seem to us less free the better we understand their cause. If the man whose actions we are considering is on a very low stage of mental development, like a child, a madman, or a simpleton, then knowing the causes of the act and the simplicity of the character and Intelligence in question, we see so large an element of necessity and so little free will that as soon as we know the cause prompting the action, we can foretell the result. On these three considerations alone is based the conception of irresponsibility for crimes and the extenuating circumstances admitted by all legislative codes. The responsibility appears greater or less according to our greater or lesser knowledge of the circumstances in which the man was placed whose action is being judged, and according to the greater or lesser interval of time between the commission of the action and its investigation, and according to the greater or lesser understanding of the causes that led to the action. Chapter 363 Thus our conception of free will and inevitability gradually diminishes or increases according to the greater or lesser connection with the external world, the greater or lesser remoteness of time, and the greater or lesser dependence on the causes in relation to which we contemplate a man's life. So that if we examine the case of a man whose connection with the external world is well known, where the time between the action and its examination is great, and where the causes of the action are most accessible, we get the conception of a maximum of inevitability and a minimum of free will. If we examine a man little dependent on external conditions, whose action was performed very recently, and the causes of whose action are beyond our ken, we get the conception of a minimum of inevitability and a maximum of freedom. In neither case, however we may change our point of view, however plain we may make to ourselves the connection between the man and the external world, however inaccessible it may be to us, however long or short the period of time, however intelligible or incomprehensible the causes of the action may be, can we ever conceive either complete freedom or complete necessity? 1. To whatever degree we may imagine a man to be exempt from the influence of the external world, we never get a conception of freedom. In space, every human action is inevitably conditioned by what surrounds him and by his own body. I lift my arm and let it fall. My action seems to me free, 
but asking myself whether I could raise my arm in every direction, I see that I raised it in the direction in which there was least obstruction to that action either from things around me or from the construction of my own body. I chose one out of all the possible directions because in it there were fewest obstacles for my action. To be free it was necessary that it should encounter no obstacles. 2. Conceive of a man being free we must imagine him outside space, which is evidently impossible. 2. However much we approximate the time of judgment to the time of the deed, we never get a conception of freedom in time. For if I examine an action committed a second ago I must still recognize it as not being free, for it is irrevocably linked to the moment at which it was committed. Can I lift my arm? I lift it, but ask myself, could I have abstained from lifting my arm at the moment that has already passed? 2. Convince myself of this I do not lift at the next moment. But I am not now abstaining from doing so at the first moment when I ask the question. Time has gone by which I could not detain, the arm I then lifted is no longer the same as the arm I now refrain from lifting. Nor is the air in which I lifted it the same that now surrounds me. The moment in which the first movement was made is irrevocable, and at that moment I could make only one movement, and whatever movement I made would be the only one. That I did not lift my arm a moment later does not prove that I could have abstained from lifting it then. And since I could make only one movement at that single moment of time, it could not have been any other. To imagine it as free, it is necessary to imagine it in the present, on the boundary between the past and the future, that is, outside time, which is impossible. 3. However much the difficulty of understanding the causes may be Increased, we never reach a conception of complete freedom, that is, an absence of cause. However inaccessible to us may be the cause of the expression of will in any action, our own or another's, the first demand of reason is the assumption of and search for a cause, for without a cause no phenomenon is conceivable. I raise my arm to perform an action. Independently of any cause, but my wish to perform an action without a cause is the cause of my action. But even if, imagining a man quite exempt from all influences, examining only his momentary action in the present, unevoked by any cause, we were to admit so infinitely small a remainder of inevitability as equaled zero, we should even then not have arrived at the conception of complete freedom in man, for a being uninfluenced by the external world, standing outside of time and independent of cause, is no longer a man. In the same way we can never imagine the action of a man quite devoid of freedom and entirely subject to the law of inevitability. 1. However we may increase our knowledge of the conditions of space in which man is situated, that knowledge can never be complete, for the Number of those conditions is as infinite as the infinity of space. And. Therefore so long as not all the conditions influencing men are defined. There is no complete inevitability but a certain measure of freedom. Remains. 2. However we may prolong the period of time between the action we are. Examining and the judgment upon it, that period will be finite, while. Time is infinite and so in this respect too there can never be absolute inevitability. 3. However accessible may be the chain of causation of any action, we shall never know the whole chain since it is endless, and so again we never reach absolute inevitability. But besides this, even if, admitting the remaining minimum of freedom to equal zero, we assumed in some given case, as for instance in that of a Dying man, an unborn babe, or an idiot, complete absence of freedom, by 
so doing we should destroy the very conception of man in the case we are. Examining, for as soon as there is no freedom there is also no man. And. So the conception of the action of a man subject solely to the law of. Inevitability without any element of freedom is just as impossible as. The conception of a man's completely free action. And so to imagine the action of a man entirely subject to the law of. Inevitability without any freedom, we must assume the knowledge of an. Infinite number of space relations, an infinitely long period of time. And an infinite series of causes. To imagine a man perfectly free and not subject to the law of. Inevitability, we must imagine him all alone, beyond space, beyond time. And free from dependence on cause. In the first case, if inevitability were possible without freedom. We should have reached a definition of inevitability by the laws of. Inevitability itself, that is, a mere form without content. In the second case, if freedom were possible without inevitability we. Should have arrived at unconditioned freedom beyond space, time, and. Cause, which by the fact of its being unconditioned and unlimited would. Be nothing, or mere content without form. We should in fact have reached those two fundamentals of which man's. Whole outlook on the universe is constructed, the incomprehensible. Essence of life, and the laws defining that essence. Reason says, 1. Space with all the forms of matter that give it. Visibility is infinite, and cannot be imagined otherwise. 2. Time is. Infinite motion without a moment of rest and is unthinkable otherwise. 3. The connection between cause and effect has no beginning and can. Have no end. Consciousness says, 1. I alone am, and all that exists is but me. Consequently I include space. 2. I measure flowing time by the fixed. Moment of the present in which alone I am conscious of myself as living. Consequently I am outside time. 3. I am beyond cause, for I feel myself. To be the cause of every manifestation of my life. Reason gives expression to the laws of inevitability. Consciousness. Gives expression to the essence of freedom. Freedom not limited by anything is the essence of life, in man's. Consciousness. Inevitability without content is man's reason in its. Three forms. Freedom is the thing examined. Inevitability is what examines. Freedom. Is the content. Inevitability is the form. Only by separating the two sources of cognition, related to one another. As form to content, do we get the mutually exclusive and separately. Incomprehensible conceptions of freedom and inevitability. Only by uniting them do we get a clear conception of man's life. Apart from these two concepts which in their union mutually define one. Another as form and content, no conception of life is possible. All that we know of the life of man is merely a certain relation of free. Will to inevitability, that is, of consciousness to the laws of reason. All that we know of the external world of nature is only a certain. Relation of the forces of nature to inevitability, or of the essence of. Life to the laws of reason. The great natural forces lie outside us and we are not conscious of. Them, we call those forces gravitation, inertia, electricity, animal. Force, and so on, but we are conscious of the force of life in man and. We call that freedom. But just as the force of gravitation, incomprehensible in itself but. Felt by every man, is understood by us only to the extent to which we know the laws of inevitability to which it is subject, from the first knowledge that all bodies have weight, up to Newton's law, so too the force of free will, incomprehensible in itself but of which everyone is conscious, is intelligible to us only in as far as we know the laws of inevitability to which it is subject, from the fact that every man dies up to the knowledge of the most complex economic and historic laws. 
All knowledge is merely a bringing of this essence of life under the laws of reason. Man's free will differs from every other force in that man is directly conscious of it, but in the eyes of reason it in no way differs from any other force. The forces of gravitation, electricity, or chemical affinity are only distinguished from one another in that they are differently defined by reason. Just so the force of man's free will is distinguished by reason from the other forces of nature only by the definition reason gives it. Freedom, apart from necessity, that is, apart from the laws of reason that define it, differs in no way from gravitation, or heat, or the force that makes things grow, for reason. It is only a momentary undefinable sensation of life. And as the undefinable essence of the force moving the heavenly bodies, the undefinable essence of the forces of heat and electricity, or of chemical affinity, or of the vital force, forms the content of astronomy, physics, chemistry, botany, zoology, and so on, just in the same way does the force of free will form the content of history. But just as the subject of every science is the manifestation of this unknown essence of life while that essence itself can only be the subject of metaphysics, even the manifestation of the force of free will in human beings in space, in time, and in dependence on cause forms. The subject of history, while free will itself is the subject of metaphysics. In the experimental sciences what we know we call the laws of inevitability, what is unknown to us we call vital force. Vital force is only an expression for the unknown remainder over and above what we know of the essence of life. So also in history what is known to us we call laws of inevitability. What is unknown we call free will. Free will is for history only an expression for the unknown remainder of what we know about the laws of human life. Chapter 364 History examines the manifestations of man's free will in connection with the external world in time and independence on cause, that is, it defines this freedom by the laws of reason, and so history is a science. Only in so far as this free will is defined by those laws. The recognition of man's free will is something capable of influencing historical events, that is, as not subject to laws, is the same for history as the recognition of a free force moving the heavenly bodies would be for astronomy. That assumption would destroy the possibility of the existence of laws. That is, of any science whatever. If there is even a single body moving freely, then the laws of Kepler and Newton are negatived and no conception of the movement of the heavenly bodies any longer exists. If any single action is due to free will, then not a single historical law can exist, nor any conception of historical events. For history, lines exist of the movement of human wills, one end of which is hidden in the unknown but at the other end of which a Consciousness of man's will in the present moves in space, time, and dependence on cause. The more this field of motion spreads out before our eyes, the more evident are the laws of that movement. To discover and define those laws is the problem of history. From the standpoint from which the science of history now regards its subject on the path it now follows, seeking the causes of events in Man's free will, a scientific enunciation of those laws is impossible. For however man's free will may be restricted, as soon as we recognize it as a force not subject to law, the existence of law becomes impossible. Only by reducing this element of free will to the infinitesimal, that is, by regarding it as an infinitely small quantity, can we convince ourselves of the absolute inaccessibility of the causes, and then, instead of seeking causes, history will take the discovery of laws as its problem. 
The search for these laws has long been begun and the new methods of thought which history must adopt are being worked out simultaneously. With the self-destruction toward which, ever dissecting and dissecting the causes of phenomena, the old method of history is moving. All human sciences have traveled along that path. Arriving at infinitesimals, mathematics, the most exact of sciences, abandons the process of analysis and enters on the new process of the integration of unknown, infinitely small, quantities. Abandoning the conception of cause, mathematics seeks law, that is, the property common to all unknown, infinitely small, elements. In another form but along the same path of reflection the other sciences have proceeded. When Newton enunciated the law of gravity he did not say that the sun or the earth had a property of attraction, he said that all bodies from the largest to the smallest have the property of attracting one another, that is, leaving aside the question of the cause of the movement of the bodies, he expressed the property common to all bodies. From the infinitely large to the infinitely small. The same is done by the natural sciences, leaving aside the question of cause, they seek for laws. History stands on the same path. And if history has for its object the study of the movement of the nations and of humanity and not the narration of episodes in the lives of individuals, it too, setting aside the conception of cause, should seek the laws common to all the inseparably interconnected infinitesimal elements of free will. Chapter 365 From the time the law of Copernicus was discovered and proved, the mere recognition of the fact that it was not the sun but the earth that moves sufficed to destroy the whole cosmography of the ancients. By disproving that law it might have been possible to retain the old conception of the movements of the bodies, but without disproving it, it would seem impossible to continue studying the Ptolemaic worlds. But even after the discovery of the law of Copernicus the Ptolemaic worlds were still studied for a long time. From the time the first person said and proved that the number of births or of crimes is subject to mathematical laws, and that this or that mode of government is determined by certain geographical and economic conditions, and that certain relations of population to soil produce migrations of peoples, the foundations on which history had been built, were destroyed in their essence. By refuting these new laws the former view of history might have been retained, but without refuting them it would seem impossible to continue studying historic events as the results of man's free will. For if a certain mode of government was established or certain migrations of peoples took place in consequence of such and such geographic, ethnographic or economic conditions, then the free will of those individuals who appear to us to have established that mode of government or occasioned the migrations can no longer be regarded as the cause. And yet the former history continues to be studied side by side with the laws of statistics, geography, political economy, comparative philology and geology, which directly contradict its assumptions. The struggle between the old views and the new was long and stubbornly fought out in physical philosophy. Theology stood on guard for the old views and accused the new of violating revelation. But when truth conquered, theology established itself just as firmly on the new foundation. Just as prolonged and stubborn is the struggle now proceeding between the old and the new conception of history and theology in the same way, stands on guard for the old view and accuses the new view of subverting revelation. In the one case as in the other, on both sides the struggle provokes passion and stifles truth. On the one hand there is fear and regret for the loss of the whole edifice constructed through the ages, on the other. 
is the passion for destruction. To the men who fought against the rising truths of physical philosophy, it seemed that if they admitted that truth it would destroy faith in God, in the creation of the firmament, and in the miracle of Joshua the son of Nun. To the defenders of the laws of Copernicus and Newton, too. Voltaire for example, it seemed that the laws of astronomy destroyed religion, and he utilized the law of gravitation as a weapon against religion. Just so it now seems as if we have only to admit the law of inevitability, to destroy the conception of the soul, of good and evil, and all the institutions of state and church that have been built up on those conceptions. So too, like Voltaire in his time, uninvited defenders of the law of inevitability today use that law as a weapon against religion, though. The law of inevitability in history, like the law of Copernicus in astronomy, far from destroying, even strengthens the foundation on which the institutions of state and church are erected. As in the question of astronomy then, so in the question of history. Now, the whole difference of opinion is based on the recognition or non-recognition of something absolute, serving as the measure of visible phenomena. In astronomy it was the immovability of the earth, in history. It is the independence of personality, free will. As with astronomy the difficulty of recognizing the motion of the earth lay in abandoning the immediate sensation of the earth's fixity and of the motion of the planets, so in history the difficulty of recognizing the subjection of personality to the laws of space, time, and cause lies in renouncing the direct feeling of the independence of one's own personality. But as in astronomy the new view said, it is true that we do not feel the movement of the earth, but by admitting its immobility. We arrive at absurdity, while by admitting its motion, which we do not feel, we arrive at laws, so also in history the new view says, it is true that we are not conscious of our dependence, but by admitting our free will we arrive at absurdity, while by admitting our dependence on the external world, on time, and on cause, we arrive at laws. In the first case it was necessary to renounce the consciousness of an unreal immobility in space and to recognize a motion we did not feel. In the present case it is similarly necessary to renounce a freedom that does not exist, and to recognize a dependence of which we are not conscious.